Hi, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm the host of Skywatch TV, and I'm honored to serve as the moderator for this debate. It was a no-brainer when Joel and Chris asked if I would participate. I hold them both in very high regard. A lot of what I know about end times prophecy I learned from reading their books. They'll be tackling a question that is sure to be controversial. It's one that has been debated by Christian scholars for the last two millennia. It hasn't been resolved yet, but we hope that by the end of this debate, you'll have a better idea of where and how the two men arrived at their positions. So, in the interest of keeping things moving and staying out of their way, let me introduce the two participants in this debate. First, on the left, the author of such books as Mount Sinai in Arabia, Mideast Beast, Mystery Babylon, and When a Jew Rules the World, Joel Richardson. You'll find him online at joelstrumpet.com. And on the right, the author of such books as False Christ, Daniel, A Commentary, Mystery Babylon, When Jerusalem Embraces the Antichrist, and Islamic Antichrist Debunked, Chris White. Online, chriswhiteministries.com. Again, the topic under discussion, will the Antichrist be a false Jewish messiah? And here to present his case first is Chris White. Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for this debate. I'm going to skip most of the preamble just because I have a lot to get to, but I do want to say right at the outset that uh, I really respect Joel and I'm really excited for this debate. I think it's going to be really fruitful. Um, I also want to say that uh, we agree on just about everything as far as I can tell except for this one issue. Uh, and related to that, I also wanted to say that the, the position that I'm going to be defending can, can sometimes be perceived as anti-Semitic. And I just want to clear the air and say that is just not who I am as a person. Uh, I love Israel. I love the Jewish people. As far as I can tell, Joel and I have the exact same outlook in terms of Israel as a nation and as a people and their future. Uh, try to think of it like this. The fact that, as Joel says in one of his recent books, a Jew will one day rule the world. That's the truest thing ever. And because it's so true, I think Satan is going to use that truth against not just the, the Jewish people in the future, but also against Christians, as we're going to see. So the thesis I'm going to be defending is that the Antichrist will present himself as the Jewish Messiah, and that he will attempt to be seen as if he is instituting what Jewish believers call the Messianic Age, and what we Christians call the Millennial Reign or the Eternal Kingdom. As most of you know, in the Old Testament, there are many prophecies about the Messiah, most of which Jesus has already fulfilled. But as some of you also know, there are other Messianic prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled, but which will be fulfilled during Jesus' second coming. So some of these prophecies are kind of obscure, not very well known. So if I jump right into showing you how the Antichrist fulfills these prophecies or attempts to fulfill these prophecies, then you might not get the importance of it. So first we're going to quickly run through some of these yet to be fulfilled messianic prophecies. This first one is pretty straightforward, pretty general. The Messiah will physically rule the entire world. Uh, this rule is not going to be optional, a rod of iron and all that. Pretty standard theology there. The next one, the Messiah will make Jerusalem the capital city of the world. We see this over and over again in Scripture. Uh, his dictates are going forth from Jerusalem. People are coming to him in Jerusalem. Isaiah says it pretty clearly here, For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is in a very messianic context. This next one is not very well known, but it's very conservative theology, which is that in the millennium, temple sacrifices will begin again. These include animal sacrifices, wave offerings, incense offerings, the whole, the whole bit, really. Uh, conservative scholars tend to view these uh, sacrifices as uh, sort of memorial, not for sin. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, yet uh, this does seem to be the case in the millennium. This is something that Joel uh, agrees with in his recent book, that he also says that in the millennium there will be a sacrificial system in the temple again. This next one is also not that well known. A worldwide pilgrimage system will be in effect. Uh, there's actually a lot of info about this in the Bible, but all nations will be expected to travel to Jerusalem regularly with various types of offerings for the true God and Messiah, Jesus Christ, in the temple. As it says here, all flesh shall worship before me in Isaiah 66. Here's another one about the nations and kings bringing their wealth day and night to the Lord from Isaiah 60. Other places talk about a yearly pilgrimage that will be required for the Feast of Booths. 
This next one, that the Messiah will sit in the temple to accept worship, seems implied in some of the other verses. Uh, it's fairly direct here in Ezekiel 43, 6 through 7, speaking of the temple in a millennial context. The next one is a crucially important messianic prophecy that Elijah will be a forerunner to the Messiah. Um, we know, of course, that John the Baptist uh, was a type of Elijah. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Another one is that the Messiah will physically defeat Assyria and Egypt and bring them into the fold of Israel. This is a very common motif in passages about the millennium. The idea is that the Lord will strike Egypt and Assyria during the day of the Lord, but then heal them and bring them into the fold. The idea is that both Egypt and Assyria will then be part of an expanded Israeli empire. After their defeat, it kind of becomes a way to define Israel's new expanded borders. That is to say, uh, from, from Egypt to Assyria is kind of a shorthand of, of describing these new borders. What's happening here is that the Messiah will restore Israel to the original borders given to Abraham in Genesis uh, 15, sometimes called Greater Israel. This next one, the Messiah will physically defeat and control the coastlands, including Moab, Ammon, the Cushites, and more. So in addition to the larger macro enemies like Assyria and Egypt, there's a separate prophecy about the Messiah uh, sort of cleaning up the, the, the interior lands, that is, those nations directly on its uh, eastern border, what is modern-day Jordan, and those on its western seacoast like modern-day Gaza Strip, places that are historical, you know, the Philistines and the Canaanites and all this other stuff. So we see this uh, being dealt with in Zephaniah too. The last two prophecies I will mention here have already been fulfilled, so I'm kind of cheating a little bit with this, but I do want to uh, put them here because they do have importance when we get to the Antichrist. The death and resurrection of the Messiah can be shown uh, to be a scriptural truth, as well as we sometimes forget how important this one is, the prophecy that the Messiah will make a new covenant. Um, this is extremely important, and of course we see this uh, prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31. Because it wasn't in the Lord's plan to fulfill the kingdom prophecies in his first coming, it did cause some confusion even among his disciples. Really, right before he ascended to heaven, on the last day that he was on earth, his disciples were asking him about it. In Acts 1 verse 6, it says, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And I'm just pointing this out to show how important these kingdom prophecies of the Messiah were. This is also probably one of the reasons that the Jewish leadership at the time didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He just didn't seem like he was about to raise an army, defeat the Romans, make Jerusalem the capital city of the world, all the things they were expecting the Messiah to do. In one of the more interesting conversations that Jesus has with the Jewish leadership, a conversation in which he tells them that he's going to judge the dead and all these amazing things, he concludes that by saying, I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. I argue in my book that this has to be a prophecy about the Antichrist. There are lots of reasons for thinking that, but I think primarily it just doesn't seem likely that this uh, weighty prophecy is about some random messianic pretender hundreds of years later, somebody like Bar Kokhba or, or many of the less successful messianic pretenders. This seems to be uh, much more significant than something like that. Remember, it's not just the Jews who are waiting for someone to fulfill these prophecies. We Christians are waiting on someone to fulfill them as well. To be clear, I'm not sure if the Antichrist is going to claim to be the return of Jesus or if he's going to claim that Jesus wasn't the real Messiah, but that he is because he fulfills all these prophecies. I'm not sure. But one thing is sure, the deception is going to be for you and me as well. And it's especially going to be difficult to resist if he comes on the scene as a hero, if he destroys some enemy that we're all super scared of, if he defends Israel from its natural enemies and restores Israel to its historic borders and then fulfills all these messianic prophecies of the millennium, let's just say there's a reason that Jesus time and time again warned us specifically against false messiahs. All right, so let's move on to this messianic checklist with regard to what the Bible says about the Antichrist. The first, the Antichrist will physically rule the entire world is pretty much a no-brainer. That is very uh, evident from Scripture. It's also evident that these nations do not have a choice in the matter. They either capitulate or are destroyed. 
Um, the next one, Jerusalem will be made the capital city of the world. There are lots of ways, in my opinion, to show this, but first let's look at Daniel 11, verse 45. It says that he's going to set up his palatial or palace or royal tents between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. The glorious holy mountain is unambiguously Jerusalem. Uh, I should say that this verse is fairly difficult to translate, evidenced by the different ways that Bible versions have it. But they're all saying basically the same thing uh, between the seas, as in the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea, and either toward the holy mountain, as the net has it here. Some say in the holy mountain. One says between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, as if it's between uh, somehow between the Mediterranean and Jerusalem. I think either way, it's clear that his palace tents are either in or very near Jerusalem. But by far the best proof texts for this are in Revelation 17 and 18. And if you stick with me through the end of this 30 minute opener, I'm pretty sure if I convince you of nothing else here, I will be able to convince you that the Antichrist's capital city is Jerusalem. All right, so the Antichrist is attacked by and defeats Assyria and Egypt, as we'll see later. He attempts to defeat Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon, but they escape from his hands, though he does uh, seem to conquer a number of the so-called micro-enemies of Zephaniah too. And then the Libyans and Ethiopians as well, also in Messianic prophecies, submit to him, which are historically known as Cush and Put. So in Daniel 11, starting at about verse 36 through 45, virtually every conservative scholar recognizes we're talking about the Antichrist at this point. So in this passage, the Antichrist is defeating and subduing the King of the South, which pretty much everybody agrees is a reference to Egypt, and the King of the North, where there is some debate, but notably Joel and I agree, is a reference to Assyria. The other countries mentioned here are also a part of specific messianic prophecies. Ethiopia, sometimes called Cush in scripture, is one of the few countries mentioned by name that the Messiah will subdue in Isaiah 11. And Libya, sometimes called Put, is mentioned by name along with Cush as countries that the Messiah will destroy during the day of the Lord. One of the more interesting things is this line which reads, Then he will enter the beautiful land. Many will fall, but these will escape. Edom, Moab, and the Ammonite leadership. Both Joel and I agree that these countries, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, are basically modern-day Jordan, which of course is currently about 95% Muslim today. My point here is that literally nothing in this passage suggests that the Antichrist is being hostile to Israel here. Look at what he does when he, quote, enters into the beautiful land. He tries to destroy all the Muslim countries. Three of them get away, but it should be noted that those three he tried to destroy are the same countries that are mentioned that the Messiah must defeat. I'm sure this is going to be a big part of this debate because Joel holds to something called the two-king theory of Daniel 11. This means that he views the king of the north, remember we both think the king of the north is Assyria, but he believes the king of the north is the Antichrist, not defeated by the Antichrist. It's a view I wholeheartedly reject and would be uh, excited to refute if he does bring it up in his video, but I just want you to notice that even if that was the case, the Antichrist is still defeating Egypt, he's trying to defeat Edom and, and Ammon, etc., and then he does defeat Ethiopia and Libya. So my, my question is, why is his Muslim Antichrist so hostile towards the Muslim world? It's, a, it's surprisingly something he doesn't bring up in his books, uh, which seems, or at least that I have seen, which seems like something of an oversight given his overarching position. All right, next up, Elijah as a forerunner. Biblically speaking, you might as well not even apply for the job of Messiah unless you also have an Elijah to point to you and say that you're the Messiah. Today, this is a huge part of Jewish tradition. They set out a chair for Elijah during circumcision ceremonies, put out a cup for him at the Passover meal. Uh, even the hymn that concludes every Sabbath makes reference to him. It says, Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, let him come quickly in our day with the Messiah, the son of David. Well, any false Messiah is going to need a false prophet, and the false prophet of Revelation 13, I believe, will claim to be Elijah the Tishbite returned to Israel in order, among other things, to point the way to the Messiah. The main reason I think that the false prophet is claiming to be Elijah the prophet is because of the miracles that he is said to do, most notably calling fire down from heaven. Calling fire down from heaven might as well be a business card that reads, I'm Elijah for some people because he is the only prophet that called fire down from heaven. 
uh, and it's something that he did three times. All right, next up we have the Antichrist instituting a new covenant and starting a form of temple sacrifice. I group these two together because I believe that they are linked in the same event. One thing is certainly non-negotiable. The Messiah must, number one, make a new covenant, and number two, start the daily sacrifices again. And it does seem like this is what the Antichrist is doing in Daniel 9, 27, and I'll show you why. Although this must be kind of a hard verse to translate for some reason because nearly every Bible translation has a slightly different take on this, the majority of Bibles have the Antichrist confirming or making an already existing covenant strong. He's not necessarily making a brand new covenant, although that could be what he's doing as well. He's basically confirming or making strong a covenant, which I take to mean the Antichrist somehow makes it possible for them to start the daily sacrifices again. And we can infer that this covenant, whatever it is, allows for the start of the daily sacrifices at the temple because of how it mentions those sacrifices ending at the midpoint. This verse is contrasting these two ideas. It's like it's saying he confirms the covenant, which started the daily sacrifices, but then three and a half years later, he stops the sacrifices. The words presuppose that the reader understands that the covenant began with the daily sacrifices starting. One of the reasons, if not the only reason, that modern Jews haven't started the sacrificial system again is because it would spark a world war because the Temple Mount is currently next door to an Islamic holy site. But as I said, whoever is allied with the Antichrist will feel very secure. After all, who can make war with a beast? Certainly not the Islamic world, as they are utterly destroyed after this point. I suspect, and this is just a guess, but it would work with a tentative timeline, that this act of him starting the temple sacrifices at the first part of the covenant, the first three and a half years, is the reason why the war in Daniel 11, 40 through 45 happens. Notably, it's those Muslim countries that attack him. I think it's important that he's going to claim to be the defender, not the aggressor in this war. He goes out to fight a war which surely will look to the Jews and probably to the Christians like something like the Gog-Magog War. He will come back completely victorious, having restored the historic Greater Israel borders. It's at that time, again, with the timeline, we can show that it's after that war that the midpoint happens, that he enters the temple, declares himself to be God, to be the Messiah. Of course, that's good theology, right? The Messiah is, in fact, God, and that he deserves the worship of the world. It's going to be a very difficult thing to resist if that happens. Next up is the resurrection of the dead of the Messiah. This is something that you can prove from Scripture. The Messiah must do. Of course, the Messiah did do it, but it also appears the Antichrist will, at the very least, appear to be resurrected from the dead. Many times in the book of Revelation, it speaks of a mortal head wound which he recovers from. It speaks of it as one of the reasons that people worship him is because he does recover from this mortal wound. I believe this is probably the strong delusion that God sends that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2. Next up is sitting in the temple to accept worship. We see this with the abomination of desolation. Paul says it fairly clearly here in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So we know that he does sit in the temple. He does declare himself to be God, which is presumably why he demands the worship of the world, because he's telling everybody that he is God. A couple of things to note here. This is actually pretty good theology if it weren't for the fact that he's most definitely not God. The real Messiah is God, and the real Messiah will sit in the temple and demand the worship of the world, which is something that I think either the Antichrist or the false prophet should be able to prove from Scripture. It's also, by the way, good theology that the daily sacrifice in particular for sins should stop when the Messiah comes, something else that I suspect either the Antichrist or the false prophet will be able to prove from Scripture. The point people miss here is that the abomination of desolation is an abomination from God's perspective, but from the people who worship the Antichrist, it won't seem like an abomination at all. To them, it will seem like the beginning of the Messianic age, the beginning of the millennium, the beginning of a promised utopia. And like all tyrants who promise a utopia, the first thing that they have to do is get rid of the people who don't believe in the utopia. And that's why the greatest persecution of all time begins exactly at this point. 
All right, the next two, the Antichrist will have a worldwide pilgrimage system to Jerusalem. Uh, merchants from the sea will bring gifts such as silver and gold, and as we'll see, a lot more. But I kept these uh, at the last here because I want to use them to transition to one of my favorite subjects in the Bible, the identity of Mystery Babylon. In my opinion, the study of Mystery Babylon is the best, most rock-solid way to prove the identity of the Antichrist. It was actually me uh, studying Mystery Babylon that convinced me of the false Jewish Messiah theory, not the other way around. But to sum up my thesis, Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18 is the last day's city of Jerusalem, the future Jerusalem that will embrace the Antichrist as Messiah and promote his worship to the rest of the world. Let's first go over the basics. These are the things that most good teachers would agree with about Mystery Babylon. Uh, Mystery Babylon is a vision that John had of a woman riding a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. We know that this beast is the Antichrist because it's the same seven-headed, ten-horned beast that we see back in Revelation 13 with names of blasphemy, etc. So obviously it's the Antichrist. So this is a picture of a woman who believes she has found her king and her husband with the Antichrist. And we see that the entire world becomes intoxicated because of the love that she has for the beast. Then an angel comes along and gives a literal interpretation of John's allegorical vision. The angel says that the woman that he saw was a city. He describes how the city will rule over the entire world. Merchants will become wealthy because of all the things they sell to it. It will be burned with fire. Basically, a lot of literal things that can happen to a city. This is why most people understand that Mystery Babylon has to be a physical city. So the thesis here is that Mystery Babylon is the last day's city of Jerusalem. Uh, the Jerusalem that has embraced the Antichrist as Messiah. A Jerusalem that is in the middle of building a new temple, uh, sacrificing with gold, silver, precious stones, incense, animal sacrifices uh, to the Antichrist, as well as actively promoting the worship of the Antichrist to the rest of the world. The first proof text is a pretty strong one. It says, In her was found the blood of the prophets. It's strong because there is only one place in Scripture where prophets were killed, which is Jerusalem. But more importantly, Jesus says that it's actually impossible for a prophet to be killed anywhere except for Jerusalem. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. So that is a pretty interesting statement. Jesus seems to be saying here that it is impossible for a prophet to perish outside of Jerusalem. He seems to reiterate this in the next verse where he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets. Well, what about this part of that verse, you might say? What about all who were slain on the earth? Surely I will need to go looking for somewhere else besides Jerusalem to find a place that the Bible says is responsible for all the blood of all the slain on the earth. But Jesus actually said that Jerusalem would be blamed for all the righteous blood shed on the earth not just for the people who were killed there. In Matthew 23, starting in verse 34, Therefore indeed I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berkiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Another proof text is regarding the term, the great city. The term, the great city, is used to describe Mystery Babylon ten times in the book of Revelation. The phrase is seen one other time in Revelation chapter 11, where it's obviously talking about Jerusalem. Speaking of the two witnesses, Revelation 11.8 says, And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So there isn't much of a way around this. We know that the city where the Lord was crucified was Jerusalem. So either John is using the term the great city to refer to two different places, or Jerusalem is mystery Babylon. Jerusalem is called a harlot several times 
and always in the context of her worshiping false gods and killing innocent people, which is exactly what Mystery Babylon is also doing. Now, I want to look at how she is dressed because I think it's clear that she's being portrayed as a harlot high priestess. Revelation 18 verse 16 says that Mystery Babylon is wearing, quote, fine linen, purple, and scarlet. This grouping of words is extremely rare in the Bible. In fact, in the Old Testament, it's only used 29 times, and all of them are in the book of Exodus. It is describing either the cloth needed for the temple, the curtains, that kind of thing, or the clothing for the high priest. Another high priest garment she has is a name written on her forehead, which reads Mystery Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. This is contrasted with the high priest who had a name also written on his forehead, except it read Holiness to the Lord. Even this phrase, mother of harlots, on her forehead is pretty interesting because in scripture, Jerusalem, as well as other cities, were referred to as mothers. Their children were the citizens of that city. Here are a few examples of Jerusalem being referred to as a mother or her children as the inhabitants. It says, uh, the filth of the daughters of Zion and purge the blood of Jerusalem. Uh, but Jesus turning unto them said, daughters of Jerusalem. Uh, in that uh, Matthew 23, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to you, how often I would have gathered your children together. So again, we have this idea of Jerusalem's children being prostitutes. She is the mother of prostitutes. One of the more fascinating things I found when researching my book about Mystery Babylon was that all the items that the merchants brought to it are specifically mentioned in other places in scripture. Sometimes the only other time they are mentioned, they are items needed to start the sacrificial system in the Old Testament or build the temple. And I believe this helps to show that this last day's Jerusalem must be in the middle of a huge worldwide pilgrimage system where people are coming in droves to worship the Antichrist. This first grouping of words is interesting for a few reasons. First, gold and silver are not a common grouping in the Bible, but as we saw, gold and silver being brought to a city for a worldwide pilgrimage by sea merchants, that concept is pretty rare, but that is a messianic prophecy. But when you take precious stones and you include that as a group, this is an exceedingly rare combination. Appearing in Daniel 11 is one of the only other times it appears, and in Daniel 11 it is the items needed to worship the Antichrist's God, which of course is extremely provocative, but it gets more interesting. We've already talked about fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, but to recap, these specific items when grouped like this are always used in scripture to refer to either the cloth material for building the temple or for the high priest's clothing. I'm going to skip a few here in the interest of time, but this next one is really provocative. It says, all manner of vessels, most precious wood and brass, iron and marble. So this grouping of words is only seen one other time in scripture, and that is in 1 Chronicles 29 verse 2, where King David lists the items he has acquired for Solomon to build the temple. In other words, these are items needed to build not just a temple, the temple. This next group has some individual words that are very rare, um, but in a group like this, you only see them in one other context, and that was to be used to make an anointing oil to consecrate the temple and all the items in it. It was also used to anoint the priests. It was considered so holy that if you made uh, this anointing oil for any other reason, you would be, quote, cut off. This next one is really interesting because the grouping is everything here. Wine and oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep. If you do nothing else, do a word search on these words and you're going to find that these are the very things needed to start the so-called daily sacrifice, a twice daily sacrifice described in Exodus 29. It's actually interesting because they first had to consecrate the priests and the altar before they could start the daily sacrifice, and one bullock and two rams or beasts were needed as well as wheat flour, which is the only time wheat is mentioned in conjunction with sacrifice in this chapter. So wheat and beasts are added to the list in Revelation 18:13 as an indispensable part of the preparation for the daily offerings. So this list of items represents a shopping list for everything that you would need if you're planning on starting the daily sacrifices again. So, Mystery Babylon is a picture of a harlot high priest. She is a harlot for the same reason Jerusalem has always been called a harlot in scripture, because she's worshiping a false god. 
but she is a high priest because she is promoting the worship of the Antichrist to the rest of the world. Revelation 18.3 puts it, For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her fornication. In other words, she is fornicating or worshiping the beast so passionately that the nations become drunk off that passion. So she's happy with her king and her husband. She worships him so intensely that the world is drawn in by it and worships the Antichrist as well. There's one other proof text I need to talk about very quickly, which is Daniel 11:37 which says, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, etc. In context, this is speaking of the Antichrist. This has led some to believe that the Antichrist must be ethnically Jewish because this phrase, God of his fathers, is a very uh, a Jewish uh, concept in the Bible to refer to Yahweh. Uh, some commentators have even gone so far to demand that it must be God of his father, or gods of his fathers with a lowercase g in plural but that's just wishful thinking on their part. The truth is, and this is something that uh, Hebrew scholars Michael Heiser, J. Paul Tanner, uh, will point out that the word Elohim, which we uh, translate as God, can be either plural or singular, but it depends on the context. There's nothing in the word that means it one way or the other. It's kind of like the English word sheep. The sheep is lost, the sheep are lost. It's the context that helps us. But here, the context, uh, it can go either way. But I would suggest this in terms of interpretation. This phrase, God of his fathers, is used several times in the Bible. Every other instance, it's used to refer to Yahweh. It is never used, the phrase God of his fathers is never used to speak of pagan gods. To sum that up, I believe that the Antichrist probably will be ethnically Jewish. The early church, which all believed that the Antichrist would be Jewish, they had some sort of odd theories that he would come from the tribe of Dan. I don't follow their reasoning on that at all. I think that he'll probably be from the tribe of Judah. Maybe he'll be able to prove or fake somehow that he's uh, uh, from the lineage of David. That's my guess, but I can't, uh, I can't prove that at all. All right, so that's my opening argument. I'll just wait to see what kind of stuff Joel brings up. I suspect he's going to want to talk about you know, Daniel 2 and 7, Daniel 9, and some other things. Uh, so we'll just wait to see what he brings up and then just tackle those things as we go. So back to you guys. We've heard from Chris, and now with 30 minutes to present his opening arguments, Joel Richardson. All right, thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, let me just begin by thanking Chris White for graciously agreeing to participate in this debate, in this very important discussion. Uh, second, I want to thank Derek Gilbert for graciously agreeing to moderate. Derek, thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, your involvement and your help here. And third, I want to thank everyone who listens in and most importantly, who studies the scriptures. Uh, in the end, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what I imagine. It doesn't matter what any of us imagine or how we picture it. The only thing that matters is what the scriptures say. What does the Bible say? So I want to jump right in. Uh, let me begin by quoting Chris White from his book, False Christ. He says, it is true that the last day's events will play out in a decidedly Jewish context, and many Jews will be taken in by it. Okay, so from Chris's perspective, again, as he explained, he believes the Antichrist will either be Jewish um, or a Jewish pretender. Uh, he, he states elsewhere that he believes he most likely will be an ethnic Jew, but he will essentially be presented as a false Jewish messiah. Again, he will be received by the Jews as their king. Okay, so Again, we need to understand what he's saying. According to Chris, a Jewish antichrist will lead Satan's last day's armies. The greatest embodiment of satanic deception is coming from Judaism and the Jews. Okay, Of all of the deceptions throughout the earth, of all of the evil throughout history, it is Judaism and the Jewish people that will be the culmination of Satan's final hurrah, his last great scheme, if you will. He believes that a Jew will overthrow the world. He believes that a Jew and his followers, the Jewish people, will primarily be the head of the spear responsible for martyring, beheading the saints throughout the earth. Okay, of all the different peoples throughout the earth, it's the Jews that are the primary source of the ultimate consummate satanic evil. So I've created here a little chart Again, sort of uh, graphing out the entire entirety of the world population. 32% would consider this, themselves Christians. 
Uh, 24% Islam. I put everyone else over there at 43%, but it's from the less than 1%, the Jews. This little tiny sliver of people who have been themselves persecuted more than any other people down throughout history, by the way, they're the ones who are going to conquer the world. They are the ones that are going to lead this great end time satanic deception and persecution. It's the Jews. They are the ones that we should be looking out for. They are the ones that we should be watching. Okay. So again, what do the scriptures say? What does the Bible say? Well, let me just begin by explaining my understanding of the scriptures, which is to say that the Bible frames the story of the Messiah and his mission, the story of redemption, primarily as the unfolding of a conflict between two seed lines and their kings. Okay, and so the basis of this idea is Genesis 3.15. This is called the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel. Okay, and this is really the foundation for all messianic prophecy, but not just messianic prophecy, also antichrist prophecy. It all begins back here in Genesis 3.15. So the fall had just happened, and the Lord makes this declaration to Satan. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, between your seed and her seed, between your descendants and her descendants, between your children and her children. And then it introduces the Messiah. It's vague and it's mysterious, but scholars all recognize this is the Messiah. He will crush your head. Someone is coming and he is going to crush your head. You will bruise his heel, you'll strike at his heel, but he's going to crush your skull. He's going to destroy you and he's going to crush your children, your followers. Okay, so this is the, the story that unfolds throughout the entire Bible. Quite frankly, this is the story. I mean, this is the foundation for the story that unfolds throughout all of the Bible. And the end times, to understand the end times in a very simple way, it is the culmination of this story. It's the same story playing out throughout the scriptures that culminates with the king of the unrighteous satanic children clashing with the king of the righteous. Now, who does the Bible say are the righteous and the unrighteous. Well, as the story continues in Genesis, we see that the promise is then made through Abraham's seed. It's then made through David's seed, ultimately, right? So the promises on one side are the children. They're very specific. The Bible names names. It tells us who they are. The children of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the children of Israel. In other words, it's Israel. And then the New Testament tells us that it will also be the spiritual children of Abraham by faith. So we could say the church. So it's Israel and the church. That's the righteous seed line. And on the other side, the children of Satan, it's Cain, it's Moab, it's Edom, it's the Assyrians, it's the Babylonians, it's Antiochus Epiphanes, is the premier prototype and forerunner of the Antichrist. It's the Romans. It's a series of adversarial Gentiles that come against the people of Israel. And that story just plays out throughout the entire Bible, and then it culminates in the last days. Again, when the people of Israel, as well as the Christians, will face the persecution and the wrath of this final Gentile king. He is the last king in a series of hostile, Gentile, pagan, satanically empowered kings. So we can look at many different verses uh, that highlight this, but let's look at just one. Numbers 24. This is the prophecy of Balaam. And he says this, How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. So he begins to prophesy, and it's a messianic prophecy. Scholars recognize this as a messianic prophecy. He says, Waters will flow from his buckets and his seed. There it is again, the seed. The seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, the promised one, the crushing one. His seed will be by many waters, and his king will be higher than Gog. Now, let me just say something here real quick. Uh, most Bible translations will read Agag, Agag. But it's important to note that many scholars believe that the proper reading here should be Gog. And it's important to note that all of the earliest biblical manuscripts all contain Gog. All six of the earliest biblical manuscripts do not contain Agag. They contain Gog. So whether it's the Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, or the Dead Sea Scrolls, or any of the three Jewish translations that were completed in the second century AD, uh, they all contain Gog. Okay, so here it actually names the Antichrist. It names that final 
king of the seed, the ultimate seed of Satan, and it calls him Gog. And this is the first reference to the Antichrist in the Old Testament by name. It calls him Gog. Well, then the prophecy continues. It says he will devour the Gentiles. What will the king and the seed of Israel do? He will devour the Gentiles who are his adversaries. So again, you can see the story of redemption as it unfolds throughout the scriptures. It's the king of Israel, the seed of Israel, in conflict with the Gentile king who are the adversaries of the righteous seed line and the righteous king. He will crush their bones in pieces. There it is again, the crushing one of Genesis 3.15. He will shatter them with his arrows. He couches, he lies down as a lion. It's now quoting Genesis 49. This is God's prophecy to Judah that says, Judah, it's through you that the Messiah is going to come, the king is going to come. And then blessed is everyone who blesses you. Cursed is everyone who curses you. Who's that talking about? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the children of Israel. Okay, what else? What else do the scriptures say? Well, the scriptures say that the final kingdom is not a Jewish kingdom. Rather, it says it is the last in a series of Gentile kingdoms. Okay, so I've got a picture here of the metallic statue of Daniel 2. This is from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And futurist commentators pretty universally recognize that the various elements, the various components of the statue represent Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then most people believe that the legs of iron represent Rome. I personally believe a much better case uh, can be made for an Islamic empire. Regardless, these are four Gentile kingdoms. These are not Jewish kingdoms. And then again, futurists generally recognize that the feet of iron and clay represent the kingdom of the Antichrist. It's a last days revival of uh, a secondary phase of the legs of iron. So whether you believe it's the Roman Empire or the Islamic Empire, either way, um, futurists generally believe that the feet of iron and clay represent the kingdom of the Antichrist. Now, if this is the case, from Chris's perspective, that would mean that you would have a series of four Gentile empires, and then the last one is a Jewish kingdom, uh, a secondary phase of the Roman Empire, right? Now, that wouldn't work. That wouldn't work. So what does Chris do? Although he is a futurist, and although he interprets all of the other prophecies and Daniel's visions through a futurist lens, he takes a preterist position concerning Daniel 2. And he says that the feet of iron and clay represent the latter phases of the Roman Empire. As the Roman Empire dissolved and decayed 400 years after Jesus. So he takes a preterist uh, position. It's very novel, very strange for a futurist to do. But he has to take that position in order to shoehorn the scriptures into his uh, Jewish Antichrist theory. Now, what is the big problem? What is the glaring problem with the preterist position? Well, it says in Daniel 2, verse 34 and 35, I mean, it makes it very clear. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, you continued looking until a stone was cut out without human hands. This stone represents the Messiah. It represents the kingdom of the Messiah. And it struck the statue on its feet, specifically the feet of iron and clay, and it crushed them. There's the crushing one. Now again, when does the Messiah crush? He crushes Satan's head when he returns. Now spiritually speaking, he accomplished that at the cross. But in, again, in real time, it takes place when he returns. So when does the Messiah crush the kingdoms of the world? When he returns. Not 2,000 years ago, as Chris is arguing. But here's the big problem for the preterists, verse 35. It says, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time. And they became like dust, like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind blew them away. There was nothing left. But the kingdom of the Messiah, it grows, it fills the whole earth. Now, essentially what Chris is saying is that when Jesus came the first time, that that was the coming of the rock. It struck the statue on the feet of iron and clay. The problem is the feet of iron and clay didn't even exist yet. They didn't exist for another few hundred years. And over the next 400 years, the Roman Empire fizzled out and eventually it went away. That is not what the scriptures say, friends. The scriptures describe something that happens immediately, suddenly, and completely. When the kingdom of the Messiah comes, when Jesus returns, he will crush the kingdom of the Antichrist. And then it says, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the legs of iron, they will all be destroyed at the same time. Time. What else? 
both Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 both say that the kingdom of the Antichrist, the beast, uh, his empire and, and the Antichrist will arise out of the sea, out of the sea. And quite frequently, seas, not always, I want to be clear, but seas quite frequently in the scriptures represent the Gentiles, as opposed to the land, which oftentimes does represent Israel. So as an example, Isaiah 60, verse 5, it's talking about the messianic age. It says, then you will see and be radiant. Your heart will thrill and rejoice. Why? Because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. What's it talking about? Well, it says the wealth of the Gentiles will come to you. So it's the abundance of the Gentiles, which here it refers to the Gentiles as the sea. This is, uh, again, common biblical motif symbolism used throughout the scriptures. The beast, both Daniel 7 and uh, Revelation 13, will emerge up out of the sea. Not out of the Jewish people, but out of the Gentiles. What else do the scriptures say? The scriptures also say that the Antichrist comes from one of the previous seven Gentile empires, right? Revelation 17, verse 11 says, The beast which was and is not is himself an eighth, so he is a revival of one of the previous seven. So futurist commentators believe that the seven here either refer to seven historical empires or seven historical persecuting Gentile kings. Again, so I personally believe it's Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the Islamic Empire being the seventh, and then the Antichrist comes back as a revival of the seventh. But the point is this, the Antichrist is a revival of one of these seven in a long chain, a historical continuum of pagan, Gentile, adversarial kings. Okay, He is not a Jewish king. There's not a single Jewish king in, in the seven here. Okay, what else do the scriptures say? Well, the Bible says, Jesus says, that the Antichrist will be the final ruler of a time period referred to as the times of the Gentiles. Luke 21, verse 25, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot. It will be crushed underfoot. The Gentiles will tread underfoot Jerusalem. This is not just an issue of them getting their dirty footprints all over the carpet. It says, trample it down like crushing grapes, okay? until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. It says the Gentiles, not the, the Jews aren't controlling Jerusalem in the last days. It says the Gentiles are con controlling Jerusalem. Until when? The times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The Antichrist is the final king during a period known as the times of the Gentiles. I mean, that should be pretty clear. Okay, now we need to understand Chris's vision of the last days. So I want to quote him a bit more so we can have a better vision of exactly what he expects us to believe the Bible teaches. So Chris says this. This is very important. He says, when the Antichrist surrounds Jerusalem with these armies, there's no indication that he's hostile toward Jerusalem. Now, in other words, from his perspective, he says the Jews will excitedly, happily receive the Antichrist when he marches into Jerusalem. They will receive him as their king because he will fulfill everything that they've been expecting. And then he will enthrone himself in the temple, and they will be excited. Here's another quote from Chris. He says, the Antichrist, quote, will probably enter through whatever gate the Messiah is supposed to enter. In other words, not in a hostile military fashion. No, he will probably be riding a donkey. And he goes on, he says, he's going to enter Jerusalem at this time as a king, as the king. He sits in the temple, not as a person defiling the temple, from the Jews' perspective. He acknowledges that it will be defiling the temple from God's perspective. He says, it's not an abomination from their perspective, right? They will be glad. They will be glad for him to sit in the temple to remove the sacrifices because he will be fulfilling, according to Chris, what the Jews are expecting, which is, he says, when the Messiah returns, he will end sacrifices. So it's not a hostile vision that he has. For him, the Antichrist sitting in the temple will be a good thing. It will be a bad thing for who? For the Christians and this remnant of Jews that will resist. But for everyone else, for the city, it's going to be wonderful. Okay, so this is very, very important. Finally, one more quote from Chris. He says, basically, anybody that should have fled Jerusalem probably should have fled Jerusalem by that time. In other words, again, any Christians or any resistors among the Jews. So for the next three and a half years, it's going to be this false facade of utopia or at least up until the rapture happens. So he says the last three and a half years, again, according to his interpretation of the scriptures, it's going to look like utopia in Jerusalem. This is very important, guys. What do the scriptures say? Let's look at what the scriptures say. 
They teach that the Antichrist kingdom and his armies will be hostile military invaders that come in to destroy Jerusalem, to destroy the holy people, to destroy the Jews, to destroy the temple, to defile the temple, to speak out against the God. Everything is against, against, against. So let's look at the scriptures. Joel 3, verse 1 through 2. At that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's Jerusalem. Then I will enter into judgment with them on behalf of my people Israel. The king of Israel comes back to destroy the armies that invade Jerusalem for the way they've treated his people. He says, my people Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. What do the armies do? They divide the land. They scatter the inhabitants of Israel throughout the nations. Joel 3, 12 through 14. Let the nations, let the Gentiles be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge the surrounding Gentiles, the neighboring nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread the winepress. Again, the winepress of the wrath of God Almighty that we see later in the book of Revelation. And what is the context of all of this? The day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, the judgment of the nations. Now, in Joel's prophecy, he uses the invading locust plague as a precursor, a forerunner, a foreshadow of the coming Babylonian armies, the invading Babylonian armies who themselves are precursors to the ultimate invading armies of the Antichrist. Again, this is not a um, facade of utopia. This is not a Jewish king. This is talking about invading Gentiles. It says Gentiles. The scriptures say Gentiles many times. Zechariah 12, 2 through 3. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all of the peoples around Jerusalem. Again, their neighbors. The siege is against Jerusalem. When? When the siege is against Jerusalem. That's hostile. That's very hostile. That's military language. It will also be against Judah. This will be an invasion not just of Jerusalem, but of all Israel. Judah is essentially southern Israel. It will come about in that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. Everyone who tries to lift it will essentially give themselves a hernia. All the nations of the earth will be gathered against against Jerusalem. The Antichrist doesn't come in on a donkey. He comes in with his armies in a hostile adversarial manner. Zechariah 12, 9 through 10, in that day I will set about to destroy all of the nations, the Gentiles that come against Jerusalem. And then what happens? He says, when they see me whom they've pierced, I'll pour out a spirit of grace and supplication of weeping and repentance, and I will pour out my spirit on them right? So this, the context of this is very clear. It's the end times. These are the armies of the Antichrist that Jesus comes back to destroy. Zechariah 14, 1 through 2. Behold, the day is coming for the Lord when the spoil will be taken from you and divided amongst you. I will gather all the Gentiles against Jerusalem to battle. Okay, this is military language, spoils, battle. It says the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, the women raped. Half of the city are exiled. This is the language of an extremely adversarial, hostile invasion. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. Listen, guys, all the prophets are telling the same story over and over and over again. Again, as Chris says, when the Antichrist surrounds Jerusalem with these armies, there's no indication that he's hostile toward Jerusalem. What else do the scriptures say? Daniel eleven thirty one, forces from him, from the Antichrist, will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress. The Antichrist's armies will do the destroying. Ezekiel 38, again, which is referred to all the way back there in Numbers 24 by Balaam. Ezekiel says the same thing that all the other prophets talk about. Verses 10 through uh, 12, it will come about in that day, thoughts will come into your mind. He's talking to Gog, the final king of the Gentiles. You will devise an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go against those who are at rest, that live securely, living at the center of the earth without bars or gates. To do what? To capture spoil, to seize plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, against the people who have been gathered from amongst the Gentiles. What does Jesus say? Luke 21, 20 through 25. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, again, these are not, uh, these are hostile invading armies, then recognize that its desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Everyone in Israel, not just a little remnant, everyone must flee. And those who are in the midst of the city must leave. Those who are in the country must uh, not enter the city, for there will be a distress upon the land and wrath upon this people. 
the land of Israel, the people of Israel. Satan has always been trying to wipe them out. This is his final effort. He says, they will fall by the edge of the sword. They will be led captive to the nations. Jerusalem, again, will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles and their king until the time of the Gentiles are over. Uh, what else do the scriptures say? The Bible teaches that the Antichrist will blaspheme and say horrible things against God. Now, Chris says that the defiling of the temple, now please listen to this, occurs not because the Antichrist is claiming that God is bad. In other words, he's not saying negative things against God. No, he says he's not presenting any overt verbal blasphemy. No, it's because he claims to be God. So essentially what Chris says is that the Antichrist will do the same thing that Jesus did, claim to be God. That's one form of blasphemy. For a man to claim to be God, if he's not God, is blasphemy. But there's another kind of blasphemy, and that's when you speak out against God. That's when you say horrible things about God. What do the scriptures say? What do the scriptures say? Daniel 7, 25, says the Antichrist will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One, against God, against his people, against the nation, against Jerusalem, against the temple, everything related to Israel, the Antichrist and Satan is against, against, against. He will speak out against the Most High, he will wear down the saints of the Highest One, and he will actually change alterations in times and laws. This is just what Antiochus Epiphanes did. He made Judaism illegal. Keeping Torah was illegal. The Antichrist will do the same thing. He's not going to establish Torah. He's going to change it. He's going to be against it. Daniel 11.36, the Antichrist will speak monstrous things against the God of gods. Again, horrible things against, against, against. This is not simply, merely claiming to be God. He's claiming to be exalted above God. He's claiming to be better than God. He's mocking God. He shows no regard for the God of heaven or any other gods. He does worship a God of forces, of fortresses, and he's exalting himself and his God above the God of the temple. That's the very purpose of sitting in the temple, is proclaiming himself to be superior to the God of the temple, Revelation 13, 5 through 6, there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. And he opened his mouth to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, those who dwell in heaven. Every time it says he speaks out against God. Okay, so this is more than just claiming to be God. And in speaking positively about God, he blasphemes God. The scriptures also say that the followers of the Antichrist are Gentiles. Revelation 11, 8 through 10. It says their dead bodies, that's the two witnesses, will lie in the street of the great city, that's Jerusalem. And it says those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and they won't permit them to be buried. The Gentiles in Jerusalem refuse to let the two witnesses be buried. It doesn't say the Jews. It says the nations. It says the Gentiles. Well, Daniel 8 and Daniel 11, both, as I've already said, use Antiochus Epiphanes as the greatest prototype, the greatest forerunner, the greatest foreshadow of the Antichrist in all of scripture, to the point where scholars, they debate amongst themselves. It's as though they go, where does the Antiochus end and the, the Antichrist begin? They're like layered on top of one another. And it's the career of Antiochus, this brutal career of invading Israel, sacrificing a pig in the temple, spreading the pork gravy throughout the temple. He didn't just go in and claim to be God. He certainly didn't claim to be the Jewish God. He defiled that thing. He purposefully spread pork juices all over the temple to defile it. That's the forerunner of the Antichrist, okay? And this is, this is not debatable. Now listen, the time of Jacob's trouble, that's the last three and a half years. The scriptures describe it as the worst period that will ever befall the Jewish people in the history of mankind. It's called Jacob's trouble. It's called Israel's distress, Israel's tribulation for a reason. Now, what is Jacob's trouble according to the scriptures? Well, it's the playing out of the chastisements of the Mosaic covenant. The Lord made it very clear. He said, if you don't obey me, if you don't serve me, here's what's going to happen. And he, he spells it out. He says, I'm going to bring the Gentiles against you. They're going to destroy your nation, and you're going to be scattered and exiled among the Gentiles. And so this has happened multiple times throughout Israel's history, right? It happened with the Assyrians, with the Babylonians, with the Romans. And it's going to happen one last time under the Antichrist. This is simply the playing out of the curses, the chastisements of the covenant. 
And so again, the historical pattern, the scriptural pattern is very clear. It's a series of invading, hostile, Gentile, pagan invaders and in exile uh, to these Gentile nations. The last days under the Antichrist will simply be the final worst of all of them. But again, the pattern, the pattern laid out by scripture is clear. They're Gentiles. They're Gentiles. The Bible consistently describes the day of the Lord as what? It's a time of judgment for the Gentiles. Listen, the last days are a time of chastisement for Israel in order to bring them to himself, in order to bring them to the end of themselves, the end of their strength, Deuteronomy 32, in order that they would all come to know him, turn to him, in order that they would all be saved. But for the Gentiles, it's judgment for the Gentiles. Ezekiel 30, verse 3, for the day of the Lord is near. It will be a time of clouds, a time of doom for the Gentiles. But why does he come back to judge the Gentiles? Well, as it says in Obadiah 15, the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. As you have done to who? To the Jews, to my people. And that's exactly what it says in Joel 3, isn't it? He comes back and he judges the invading nations for how they have treated his people Israel, for scattering his people among the nations and dividing up his land. Finally, Isaiah 34 says this, draw near all you nations, you Gentiles, and hear and listen, you peoples. Let the earth and all it contains hear. For the Lord's indignation is against the Gentiles. His wrath is against their armies. Why? Because he has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution, of recompense for the controversy of Zion. The Jewish king comes back to kill the Gentile king for how he and his armies have treated God's people, Israel, as well as the Christians, okay? That's the biblical narrative. So the biblical story that begins all the way back there in Genesis 3.15, it ends in the book of Revelation. And it's simply telling the same story over and over and over again. So in conclusion, let me just say this. To say that the Antichrist will be Jewish, this is as unbiblical as claiming that Jesus himself is a Gentile. Okay, these views, these are not simply unbiblical views. These views are evil. They are satanic, and they've been around for a long time. They take on many different forms. The Jews control the world. The Jews are going to control the world. The Jews are going to produce a king that will be the overthrower of the world. The Jews control the banking system. The Jews control the media. The Jews control the United States. The Jews are going to produce the individual that will be responsible for the shed blood of the saints, for the beheading of multitudes of saints throughout the earth. It is the Jews that are the greatest culmination of satanic deception that mankind has ever known. Friends, again, this view is not simply unbiblical. It is satanic. And as such, it should be rejected and it should be repented of. It should be resisted by people who know the scriptures and more importantly, by people who know their God. Okay, you've heard their opening arguments. Now we move to the second round where each man will have 15 minutes to respond. And up first is Chris White. The vast majority of the verses that Joel cites against my theory are prophecies about Armageddon and the Gog Magog War in which Gentile nations attack Israel. But what should be clear from my writings is that I absolutely agree with all of those verses, but it's all about when those events happen. Let's look at a timeline that I know Joel would more or less agree with since we hold to a very similar view with regard to the timing of the day of the Lord. All the verses that Joel cites about nations attacking Israel occur after the day of the Lord begins, either at Armageddon, at the very end of the seven year period, or in many cases he's citing verses that occur at least 1,000 years after Armageddon according to Revelation 20 verse 7, but we will come back to that later. My point is that there are two faces of the Antichrist. One face he wears during the first three and a half years, as well as the time just after the midpoint, but before the day of the Lord. It's during this earlier time that I maintain there is no evidence to suggest he's being hostile towards Israel, none whatsoever. But once the day of the Lord's wrath begins, the mask comes completely off, and he does in fact attack Jerusalem, as well as God himself in Israel at Armageddon. In fact, this is the real tragedy of Mystery Babylon. The woman that was so sure she had found her husband and king is betrayed and attacked and burned with fire by the Antichrist whom she worshipped. This attack is near the end of the 70th week when the Antichrist and his kings go to war against the Lamb at Armageddon. 
Once the wrath of God starts in the day of the Lord, like the trumpet and bold judgments, we pretty much don't see anything from the Antichrist in the timeline. Really, the next we see him is gathering nations for Armageddon, where he basically commits suicide in a war against the Lamb. As a side note, Armageddon and the Gog Magog War share the same basic model. That is, armies marching on Israel and then are defeated by God himself. Armageddon is a typological prefiguration of the Gog Magog War, but the actual literal fulfillment of the Gog Magog War is at least 1,000 years after Armageddon, and so there's no theological possibility for the Antichrist to be involved in the Gog Magog War since he has been in the pit of hell a thousand years before it even happens, and thus the idea of the Antichrist being named Gog is just wrong. I encourage you to go through all the recent papers and the details about this because it's becoming a very well established view, and the arguments against it are pretty weak and dealt with in the papers. Like people say, well, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the nations are mentioned specifically, but in Revelation 20, it just says the nations are from the four corners of the earth. Well, yeah, one is general and one is specific. Again, Armageddon is a typological prefiguration of the Gog Magog War, but the Gog Magog War definitely occurs 1,000 years after Armageddon. There are similarities, just like there are with any type, but that is a view you can defend. All that being said, I believe that there are two passages that could be used to suggest that the Antichrist is hostile to Israel before the day of the Lord, and Joel mentions both of them, which are related to the Gentiles trampling Israel. So let's look at Revelation 11, where I believe the same trampling in Luke 21 is further defined for us. It says, Then I was giving a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. So what do we know for sure here? We know that there's a temple. We know that the temple has worshipers at this time. We know that the temple has a court that is given to the Gentiles. This seems to be a reference to the court of the Gentiles, which in previous temples was the place you went to buy the animals you were going to sacrifice, or to change out your currency to the temple's currency. It was a place where Gentile converts to Judaism were allowed to enter. This passage is suggesting that in the end times, Gentiles will come in massive droves to the temple in Jerusalem. As I pointed out in the first video, Jerusalem is going to be the capital city of the world in the end times. There will be a constant stream of Gentiles. And this temple is literally going to be the busiest place on the planet. And that's what's meant by Gentiles trampling the city. Joel, on the basis of this word trample, wants you to believe that these Gentiles are destroying the city. But this would be a pretty odd way to put this if it were true. Why mention that Gentiles had been given a court at all? In fact, why is there even a temple standing with people worshiping in it at all? In Joel's view, Muslims are, I guess, rampaging the temple for three and a half years, but apparently they aren't even able to stop people worshiping there? That view just doesn't fit. Again, all the evidence he has for this is the word trample, which, to be fair, can mean to destroy, but check out some of the other meanings, including this very interesting way the same underlying Greek word is used in the Septuagint. Isaiah 1 says, When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. So God is dissatisfied with Israel in this verse, and he tells them that their sacrifices are vain. He calls their comings and goings to the temple to offer these vain sacrifices, quote, trampling of his courts. And you have to admit that's a pretty coincidental usage of the same word. So this idea of Gentiles trampling the city is, in my opinion, the best hope for somebody trying to prove that the Antichrist is being hostile towards Israel before the day of the Lord, but instead it just ends up being one more proof text that in the last days all the world, including the Gentile world, will be forced to travel to the temple to offer sacrifices to the Antichrist. Next, I want to talk about Joel's idea that the abomination of desolation cannot be an endorsement of the temple, but rather the Antichrist sitting in the temple must be an overt defiling of the temple, like, quote, spilling pig's blood on the altar, in other words, as a way to delegitimize it. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians 2.4 because it's pretty clear what's going on here if we look at the meanings of these words. It says, He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, and as a result he takes his seat in God's temple displaying himself as God. So the Antichrist exalts himself over two things here. First is so-called gods, which is almost universally understood by translators to be equated with small g gods, like in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 5. 
But more interesting, he also exalts himself over every, quote, object of worship, which is a Greek word that only appears one other time in the New Testament, in Acts 17, to describe the various statues to the Greek gods in Athens. So this passage is saying that the Antichrist exalts himself over every pagan god and every pagan idol, and as a result takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. The Net Bible translates this as a result and with a small and large G's added because they see the obvious contrast that's being made here because of the reference to the pagan deities earlier. This is a picture of the Antichrist specifically and intentionally legitimizing the temple over and above every other type of god. Joel's idea that we must copy and paste every aspect of Antiochus and apply it to the Antichrist would break down very quickly if you brought it to its logical conclusion, which is why no responsible commentator uses types like that. Moses was a type of Christ, David was a type of Christ, but you can't copy and paste aspects of their life and apply it to Christ, or you would end up with heresy. In terms of the Antichrist speaking blasphemy against God, while on one hand I would think that anybody sitting in the temple that wasn't God, claiming to be God, is in fact blasphemy against God, I also kind of agree with Joel in the fact that the Antichrist will be overtly blasphemous in some way, but I would argue that we don't have enough information to know the exact lies, the exact spin, the exact doctrine that the Antichrist will present at this point. But you can bet it's going to be clever and it's going to be awful. Try to think of it like the Jehovah's Witnesses or something. The Jehovah's Witnesses speak blasphemous things against God, but to those who believe it, it doesn't seem like blasphemy to them. To them, it seems like true Christianity. In other words, I think that you could be blasphemous against God as a function of your false doctrine, and that's over and above him sitting in the temple declaring himself to be God. Joel says that I'm saying that the end times will play out as a Jew versus Gentile war. He shows how few Jews there are in the world in an effort to discredit this idea. But I'm saying the Antichrist followers will be both Jew and Gentile. In fact, the vast majority will be Gentiles since the vast majority of the world is Gentile. But there will be Jews there as well, probably the two-thirds of national Israel that Zechariah tells us God destroys in the day of the Lord. But again, the Antichrist followers will be primarily Gentile. Let's talk about the seven kings issue from Revelation 17. Joel says that the Antichrist has to be revived from one of these previous six kings, but all this verse is saying is that the Antichrist will resurrect from the dead. Compare these two verses from the same chapter because they define each other, and they're both saying that the Antichrist will resurrect from the dead, but in different ways. One says, the beast you saw was and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Another says, as for the beast that was and is not, it is the eighth, but it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. Again, the Antichrist really does seem to resurrect from the dead. It's one of the more prominent themes about the Antichrist. If you're having trouble with the concept, I suggest you see a paper called Can Satan Resurrect the Dead Toward a Biblical View of the Beast's Wound? But spoiler alert, it's the strong delusion God sends in 2 Thessalonians 2 for the specific purpose of getting those who reject him to quote, believe the lie. So anyway, the term rise from the bottomless pit in verse 8 is using the same term, abyss, that was used to describe where Jesus rose out of when he resurrected from the dead. So the first point is that coming up from the abyss can be shown from scripture to mean resurrection from the dead. The next point is that the unsaved world quote unquote marvels because they see the beast that was and is not and then was again which is the same reason we'll see that they marveled at the beast, the same rare Greek word, back in Revelation 13, 3. But there, it is unambiguously talking about his resurrection from the dead. It says, one of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Basically, all this verse is saying is that the Antichrist will be the final seventh king, and that he will rule twice due to his resurrection. It has literally nothing to do with reviving either the Roman or the Islamic empires. That thinking was born out of well-meaning reformers who twisted scripture as much as possible to make the Roman Catholic Church the Antichrist, and we're still dealing with that fallout today. Joel talks about Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, and there's no way I can do this the justice it deserves. I would encourage you to read a paper called Daniel 2 and 7, Are They Equal or Not? by Charles Cooper. But Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are distinct prophecies. 
And while Daniel 7 is about the yet future Antichrist and various kingdoms that he conquers on his way to power, Daniel 2 is a prophecy about when the Messiah would arrive on the earth to establish his kingdom. And it's probably the main reason messianic expectations were so high during Jesus' day. Joel calls this a preterist viewpoint, but I can assure you I'm as futurist as they come, and this view has literally nothing to do with my view of the Antichrist. This prophecy, in effect, tells the reader how long in the future it will be, from Daniel's perspective, until the Messiah would come to establish the kingdom of God. Joel's point is that the kingdom of God rock here destroys the statue quickly. So this can't be talking about the setting up of the kingdom of God slowly in Jesus' day during the Roman Empire, despite the fact that that's exactly what it says, setting up. He wants this to be about the culmination of the kingdom of God in the future with Jesus' second coming, a view that I used to hold as well. But notice that the stone that struck the statue, quote, became a great mountain and filled the entire earth. That's an odd way to put it if this was something that was so sudden and instant as Joel says. What in the world could a small stone that is obviously called the kingdom of God that grows into a large mountain over time mean? Thankfully, once again, Jesus leaves no room for speculation. First, he makes it abundantly clear that the kingdom of God began in the Roman Empire during his day. Pause the screen since I don't have time to read these. Next, we find out why the Daniel 2 stone was described as growing into a mountain, because it's exactly what the kingdom of God is supposed to do. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. The kingdom of God began with those first 12 guys, but now it's expanded to you and me and is growing still. In my commentary on Daniel, I go through every last detail of these feet and toes of iron and clay, and it's one of the most detailed prophecies in the Bible, and it's about the sad end of the Roman Empire. For you naysayers out there, let me ask you this. Other than Daniel 2, can you think of any place in the Bible that even hints at the idea of the Antichrist kingdom being divided and weak, with one half of his kingdom strong and the other very weak, where they try at least twice to cleave together with political marriages, but it doesn't work? It's nonsense. Again, thank you, Reformers and Hal Lindsey. As far as Daniel 7, I agree this is a yet future prophecy. And despite what Joel says, I do think these beasts are Gentile nations, though I see them as contemporary with the beast. For example, these beasts seem to be combined into the Antichrist kingdom in a contemporary battle. And three of the beasts are allowed to live on in the millennium? And that makes no sense as historical, long-dead kingdoms. Again, check the paper I mentioned or my commentary on Daniel. But the point I wanted to make here was about them coming up from the sea. Despite the fact that you should never build doctrine from an allegory, the sea doesn't always mean Gentiles, I do think these are Gentile nations, and I do think the Antichrist will come from a Gentile nation based on Daniel 7 and Daniel 11. My personal view, again, just a personal view, is that the kingdom of the Antichrist originally comes from somewhere in the Balkans, probably Greece or Macedonia, because the king of the West in Daniel 11 is Macedonia, and it's the only king not mentioned in Daniel 11, 36 through 45. So I think the Antichrist does come on the scene as a military leader from outside Israel, and Joel knows this too because I mentioned it in the podcast he cited twice in his opener, so I'm not even sure what this argument is about. To be honest, I didn't follow his Genesis 3.15 theory, but I agree that the seed of the woman is Jesus, and the seed of the serpent ultimately is the Antichrist, but I think his making this about an ultimate race war against Jews and Gentiles seems to forget about the institution of the church, and I can't see any scenario where the seed of the serpent being a reference to Gentile people makes any satirological sense. And as far as I can tell, he's holding a modified view of the seed of the serpent heresy, except that in his view, the seed of the serpent is Arab peoples. Thank you, Chris. And now with his 15-minute response is Joel Richardson. All right. So in this session, I have 15 minutes to respond to Chris's opening statements. Now, in summary, Chris essentially makes four primary arguments. So that gives me about four minutes uh, to respond to each point. We'll see how we do. So Chris's first uh, argument is it's really not exegesis at all. It's really just a matter of um, he's just making suggestions. Essentially, what he's saying is he goes, look, according to the Bible, 
uh, the Messiah during the millennium is going to accomplish all sorts of various things. And he goes, when you look at the career of the Antichrist, there are a handful of parallels that seem to align with what the Messiah himself will do. And then he concludes, therefore, uh, the Antichrist will claim to be the Messiah. Now, first of all, let me just say this. This is not biblical exegesis. This is just theorizing. Again, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what does the Bible say? At the beginning of my opening statements, I said, it doesn't matter how I picture it. It doesn't matter how I imagine it. It doesn't matter uh, you know, how I could picture it or imagine it. The only thing that matters is what do the scriptures say? Okay, so his second point is he cites John 5, 43. Now, this is usually the first verse that Everyone who claims that the Antichrist will claim to be the Messiah, this is the one they always point to. Jesus said this, he said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Now, Chris says this, he says, I argue in my book, this has to be a prophecy about the Antichrist. Why? I would argue, no, it doesn't. Look at the verse again. It doesn't say anything at all about the Antichrist. Even the context of it doesn't indicate that he's talking about the Antichrist. Jesus was simply warning not to follow false Jewish messiahs. It's really that simple. There were all kinds of various messiah claimants in the first century, mostly um, messiahs that were trying to raise up insurrectionist movements. And Jesus' warning was really very simple. He goes, if the messiah doesn't burst forth from heaven in blazing glory like the lightning, across the sky, flashing from the east to the west, pay no attention to them. If they're out in the desert doing this, doing that, pay no attention. Because when the Messiah comes back, he is going to come back in the glory of his father, right? Jesus made it very clear. Pay no attention to false messiahs. Now, Chris makes this statement, which is, to me, really stunning. If He says, there were false messiahs who would turn up in the coming centuries. In my opinion, however, none of these Messiah claimants were significant enough or widely accepted enough to warrant a singling out of one over the other by Jesus. So essentially, Chris is saying, yeah, there were some different Messiah claimants that came along. In fact, in his opening statements, he mentioned Bar Kokhba. He goes, but none of them were really that significant. Guys, this is amazing. Okay, now I understand that most Christians are not familiar with Bar Kokhba and the Bar Kokhba revolt, but we should be. Look, this was roughly 130 AD. Okay, so this is about 100 years after Jesus. Now, this was the third great revolt. The first revolt was 70 AD. That's what led to the fall of Jerusalem. Then there was a second revolt, and then the third one. This was the decisive end, end of the nation of Israel. This was the end, okay? So there's this guy named Shimon ben Kosiva. Okay, and the revered Rabbi Akiva, probably the greatest rabbinic authority in the land at the time, he changed his name, he changed a letter in his name, altered the, the Hebrew Ben to the Aramaic Bar, and he called him Bar Kokhba. Okay, changed one letter, which means son of the star. So he was trying to say that he's the fulfillment of the Numbers 24 prophecy, a star will rise from Jacob. And he declared him to be the Messiah. And they together engaged in a rebellion against the Romans. 580,000 Jews died, according to Dio Cassius, the historian. And he says, and an uncountable number died of starvation and plagues and diseases and all kinds of things. And the remaining Jews in the land were taken as prisoners, as slaves, as exiles. Okay. Hadrian changed the name of the land after this from Judea to Syrian Palestina. He changed the name of Jerusalem to Jupiter Capitolina. Guys, this was the decisive end of the nation. The entire nation, except for the Messianic Jews that followed Jesus, right? Because they're not going to follow a false Messiah. The entire nation followed Bar Kokhba. And this was the beginning of 1,800 years of exile. The fact that Chris says there was no significant Messiah claimants after Jesus is mind-boggling. Chris's third primary argument is he says, well, the Antichrist is going to defeat, and he lists a whole bunch of nations. He lists Egypt, Libya, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Kuwait, parts of Turkey. He includes a map, okay? And he says, basically, the Antichrist is going to be defeating all of the nations around Israel. So that points to, again, the logical conclusion is he must be a Jew defeating all of Israel's 
enemies. Now, here's the verse. Here's the verse that he cites uh, as his basis for this uh, idea. Daniel 11, 41 through 42. It says, he, the Antichrist, will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. He'll also enter the beautiful land, that's Israel, and many countries will fall. Guys, when I read that, what I see is it says he's going to conquer all kinds of different nations, including Israel. Israel is included in the list of nations that will fall. I look at Chris's interpretation and I say, I don't think this verse means what you think it means. And it goes on. It says that um, essentially Jordan will be rescued out of his hands. He will stretch out his hands against Egypt. Okay, so first of all, here's the, here's the reality. Yes, the Antichrist will conquer many nations that surround Israel as he consolidates his regional power. The Antichrist doesn't just, everyone just submits to him and joins his coming empires, coming kingdom. No, he will conquer and subdue and essentially appropriate their armies. But the scriptures are clear that these very nations, these very nations will then invade the land of Israel. What do the scriptures say? Look at Ezekiel 30, verses 2 through 3. We looked at it in my opening statements. Thus saith the Lord God, wail, alas, for the day of the Lord is near. The context of this is the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, the judgment of the nations. It says it will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. A sword will come upon Egypt. Who does Jesus' judgment come against? Egypt, anguish will be in Cush, that's Sudan, Cush, Put, Lud, all of Arabia, Libya, and all the people, notice this, of the land that is in league. There is a coalition. They are united against Israel, and Jesus comes back to judge them. The same thing is seen in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Thus saith the Lord God, behold them against you, O Gog. And again, he lists Persia, Cush, Put, and they are coming against the land of Israel. The very nations that Chris says will be conquered by the Jewish king will actually be conquered by Jesus when he returns. Why? Again, we already looked at it because of the way they treat his people Israel. They scattered my people among the nations. They invaded my land, right? This is the problem uh, when you begin with a theory and then you go back into the pages of scripture and try to force it to fit your theory, essentially try to shoehorn it in to make it fit your theory, is you end up having to either, I mean, by necessity, you have to ignore a whole host of passages or twist them. So this is the next major passage that Chris uses to um, defend his position. Zechariah 13, 8 through 9. This is in his book, False Christ, page 39. Chris says this. He says, Zechariah 13, 8 through 9. Pay attention to this says that only one-third of national Israel will repent in the end times. Therefore, it can be reasonably argued that many of them will, like the Gentiles, worship the Antichrist. What do the verses actually say? Let's look at it. Zechariah 13, 8 through 9. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish. But the third part will be left in it. The Lord says, I'll bring them through like the fire. I will refine them. They will turn to me. Okay, so Chris is right. Only a third survive. But he says it can be reasonably argued that many of the other two thirds will worship the Antichrist. What is the context of the passage? What is the context of this prophecy? Now, the next verse after this is 14 verse 1. And remember, the chapters are not part of the text. This is one continuous prophecy. It goes on to define the context. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil will be taken and divided amongst you. I will gather the Gentiles against Jerusalem to battle. We've already looked at this. The context of the two-thirds is they are cut off because they are killed by the invading Gentiles. The city will be captured, the women raped, etc., etc. It doesn't say they will worship the one that's invading the land. No, it says he will kill them. This is just another example of having to manipulate the text in order to make it fit a pre-existing theory. We have to submit to the scriptures. Finally, Chris's last argument, and he says this is his rock-solid argument. He spends the last third uh, of his opening statements talking about this. Is Essentially, he says he became convinced that Jerusalem is Mystery Babylon. The prophecy of Revelation 17 and 18 is talking about Jerusalem. 
and therefore the Antichrist must be Jewish. He says, in my opinion, the study of Mystery Babylon is the best, most rock-solid way to prove the identity of the Antichrist. It was actually my study of Mystery Babylon that convinced me of the false Jewish Messiah theory, not the other way around. Okay, so first of all, let me just say this. I don't have time uh, to go through all of his points and, um, and discuss them. Perhaps I can get to that later. Um, but let me just say this. This is classic bad biblical interpretation. You do not develop theology by starting with the book of Revelation and then go back and try to reverse all of the other passages to fit your theory. There is a reason that the book of Revelation comes last, especially the last few chapters, Revelation 17 and 18. In interpreting and understanding the book of Revelation, we have to understand that it is filled with citations, with quotations, with echoes and allusions back to the Old Testament. In any issue of theology, you begin with the foundation. You begin with the Old Testament, and then with the themes and the concepts that are consistent and repeated throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Bible, then we come to the conclusion, the crescendo, the book of Revelation. But the very fact that he admits that his entire theory is because he was convinced of the identity of Mystery Babylon as Jerusalem, and then he went back and tried to prove it. This is evidence, guys. This is horrible. This is a horrible way to interpret the Bible. Let me just give you one example. Okay, Chris says he's convinced that Mystery Babylon is Jerusalem. Now, what does the Bible say about Mystery Babylon? It says, Then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. Okay, so it ceases to exist. It will become a perpetual smoking ash heap void of any inhabitants. Now, what do the scriptures say about Jerusalem? Well, the Bible tells us repeatedly that when Jesus returns, he will rule the world forever from Jerusalem to restore the throne of who? His father, David. Where? On Mount Zion. Where is Mount Zion? You can Google Maps it. <laughs> it is in Jerusalem. Psalm 110, 1 through 2. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, for the law will go forth from where? From Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. They will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. You can quote all kinds of negative critical verses about Israel, about Jerusalem. There's plenty of negative stuff to say. However, the sentiment of the scriptures is mercy toward rebellious Jerusalem. God is faithful. Jerusalem is unfaithful, but he will redeem his unfaithful people. He will redeem them. It's the very notion that after the Lord working with his people, working with Jerusalem for thousands of years, the very idea that rather than redeeming them and making them his bride, Rather, he's going to burn them and cast them into the sea. That is an absolute affront to Scripture, and it's an affront to God himself. Listen, friends, it really ultimately boils down to this. Proper biblical interpretation, responsible biblical interpretation, is not coming to the Bible with some theory, with some pet idea, and then going back into the Old Testament to all manner of different passages and trying to shoehorn, manipulate them to fit our pre-existing theory. We don't have the freedom just to go back and say, well, you know, I've got this theory. And Joel, uh, Prophet Joel doesn't really quite fit my theory, so I'm just going to rip that out and throw it away. You know, yeah, Zechariah 12, uh, Ezekiel, Micah, there's so many passages that don't fit. We're just going to rip them out of the Bible because I have a theory, right? That's not proper biblical interpretation. And that's not the Bible, by the way. It's the Book of Mormon. Ultimately, proper biblical interpretation is very simple. We come to the text, we come to the Bible, we allow it to speak for itself, and then we submit ourselves to the text. That's our only option. Some very interesting ideas coming out in this debate, and we move now to the third round, where each man will have 10 minutes to express his opinions and respond to the arguments of the other. And first up is Chris White. I'd like to bring up Mystery Babylon. Joel didn't address a single issue that I raised about it, but he did bring up Revelation 18.21, which says 
Then a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. In my book, I devote an entire chapter to this verse because, as I say in the book, I think this is the best argument against the Jerusalem theory. That being said, I think you'll quickly see how Jerusalem can be both found no more and live on eternally in both the millennial and eternal kingdoms. Part of the answer lies in the last eight chapters of Ezekiel. There you will find incredibly detailed building plans for Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple of the millennium. Here are some interesting things to know about the Jerusalem in the millennium. It will be perfectly square and nine times larger than the current city of Jerusalem. The exact location is debated. Some scholars say it's centered in Bethlehem. Others have proposed Shiloh or Ramat Rahel, but the consensus does seem to be south of modern Jerusalem. The land is also nothing like modern Israel. It sits on top of a massive plateau with two rivers coming out of either side. Just the temple itself will be the size of the current city of Jerusalem, but that temple will be placed outside the city. The last words of the book of Ezekiel actually give this city a different name. It calls it Yahweh Shema, sometimes translated the Lord is there. And then you have the eternal kingdom. In that case, Jerusalem is 1,500 miles wide and it literally comes down from heaven. So God will intentionally call the millennial Jerusalem, Jerusalem, despite it having a different size, location, and topography, at least until a totally different Jerusalem, which will also be called Jerusalem, descends from heaven. Joel got pretty heated at this point in the video because he said that the idea that God would judge Jerusalem in the same way that he judges Mystery Babylon would be an affront to God and an affront to the scriptures. But to that I would say that God clearly and consistently promises Jerusalem's destruction over and over again in the scripture. And many times it's clear that it's both his will and for the specific sin of them being a quote harlot. In fact, the specific judgments that Mystery Babylon gets is yet another reason that convinced me of this theory, because it has direct parallels to prophecies in Ezekiel, among others. In Ezekiel 16, God makes it clear that he is judging Jerusalem for being a spiritual harlot, though he is using an unnamed they to do it. They will strip her naked and burn her with fire as a judgment for her harlotries. Now look at Revelation 18, where the ten kings, the they, also strip the prostitute naked and burn her with fire. So another harlot city being judged by God through agents by stripping her naked and burning her with fire. It's extremely coincidental in this context. Also, have you ever noticed that when Jesus returns and splits the Mount of Olives, which is in Jerusalem, by the way, he tells his people to flee the city, presumably because of the earthquake-like effects of his splitting the mountain. Why is Jesus getting his followers out of Jerusalem at this point? This happens at the same point in the timeline as Mystery Babylon being judged, where they have the greatest earthquake of all time, and the city is split into three parts. I haven't vetted this theory entirely, I really just noticed it in this debate, but it is provocative. In any case, if Joel wants to tell me the idea of God judging Jerusalem is an affront to God, he really needs to take it up with Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John. Moving on to Daniel 11, 40 through 45, here Joel admits that the Antichrist does seem to be conquering the Muslim world, which is the first I've ever heard him mention that, and I've read a lot of Joel's material. He says, though, this is just about the Antichrist consolidating his kingdom, and that I'm making too much of the same nations being specifically mentioned in passages about the Messiah conquering these same nations. He incredibly ironically brings up this verse in Ezekiel 30, which says, Cush and Put and Lud and all Arabia and Libya and the people of the land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. So this is a picture of God judging these nations in the day of the Lord. Joel says that this verse proves that these nations, which are basically the same ones in Daniel 11, are in league against Israel. He doesn't say how it proves it. He kind of suggests that the word league shows that they're in a league. But the thing is, even in the translation he's using here, the ESV, it has a footnote which makes it clear that the phrase, the people of the land that is in league, means, quote, the sons of the land of the covenant. Other translations make this a little more clear, saying things like, along with everyone in the land of Israel who is in league with them. This verse is saying that in the last days, Israel will be a part of this coalition, or at least some part of Israel will be a part of this coalition. This verse doesn't prove that these nations are allied against Israel at all. This is a proof text for my view. 
The other thing that Joel does with regard to Daniel 11, 40 through 45, is that he basically says, well, okay, fine, these historic enemies of Israel are conquered by the Antichrist, but later various Gentile nations will come against Israel at Armageddon. I talked about this tactic last time, but I want to reiterate it because it's shaping up to be about 75% of his arguments against me so far in this debate. The argument goes like this. I say the Antichrist will present himself as the Jewish Messiah, to which Joel says, no, he won't. The Antichrist attacks Israel at Armageddon. Here's another reason that the Armageddon argument is irrelevant. It's a necessary component of the doctrine of the Antichrist that the Antichrist will turn on his capital city at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. So let's look at that from Joel's perspective. Joel believes that the Islamic Antichrist's capital city will be Mecca. So if Joel wants to remain consistent, he must also believe that at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, the Islamic Antichrist will turn on Mecca and burn it. Does that mean that the Islamic Antichrist didn't pretend to like Mecca during the first 99.9% .9 of his career? Joel would say, of course not. To which I would say, well, let's stop quoting these Armageddon and Gog Magog verses since they are just wasting your time. Joel makes what I think is a very bad argument, if I understand it right, about Zechariah and the two-thirds of national Israel that will die during the day of the Lord. He argues that they will die at Armageddon by the hand of the Antichrist, and so he says, why would Israel worship the Antichrist who will kill them? It's like saying, why would you get married to someone who will divorce you in the future? Well, they don't know the future. Just because, in your view, they are killed by the Antichrist at Armageddon, doesn't mean that they knew that would happen seven years earlier when they made a covenant with him. With regard to John 5.43, I think you can think this is about Bar Kokhba if you want, but my point is it just doesn't seem sufficient enough. This is the most weighty thing Jesus ever said to the Jewish leadership. In this John 5, he says his words are eternal life. He says the scriptures are about him. He says that he grants eternal life that he will raise the dead, and that he will personally judge the world at the end of time. And then, according to Joel, he apparently concludes all this by saying, you won't receive me, but you will receive Bar Kokhba. I'm just wondering if in Joel's view, the Jews are done receiving false messiahs, which is why he must have this apply to a past one like Bar Kokhba. I say that because Jesus did make a prophecy about false messiahs that would, quote, deceive many in the last days. I mean, how do you define a messiah? Is it just a leader in your view? Is there any scenario where a future false messiah that deceives many doesn't apply to the Jews? I wanted to quickly mention Joel's view on the Gog-Magog war. He believes that Gog-Magog is the same as the Battle of Armageddon and that the Antichrist's name is Gog. I refute him point by point on this in my book, but in my view, the biggest problem with making these the same war, not just a typological prefiguration, is that in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Gog-Magog war happens when Israel is, quote, dwelling securely, dwelling in a land that has undergone a restoration from the sword, a land of unwalled villages, peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. This idea of dwelling securely applies perfectly to the millennium, where the Bible specifically tells us this Gog-Magog war will happen. But it is utterly absurd to think this is a reference to Israel just before Armageddon, when the wrath of God is almost over, there's no more grass, the sea is blood, demon scorpions have been stinging people for five months straight. It's not exactly safe anywhere. Joel makes half-hearted allusions to the covenant that the Antichrist made at the beginning of the 70th week, but that obviously doesn't apply anymore at that point. Joel posted this on Twitter last night, so I'm pretty sure he's going to bring up the seed of the serpent. So I wanted to say this. Joel, you said that the seed of the serpent was Gentiles. You gave examples like Cain and Antiochus. You used Genesis 3.15 as a proof text that the Antichrist couldn't be Jewish because the seed of the serpent was Gentiles. If, as I'm sure you're going to explain in your video, you really don't think it's actually Gentiles, you think it's spiritual, except in the case of the Antichrist, that's fine, that's good doctrine, but also recognize that Genesis 3.15 in that case is utterly irrelevant. And now with his second response for 10 minutes this time, it's Joel Richardson. Okay, so in this segment, I have 10 minutes to respond specifically to Chris's first response. So let me begin just by addressing some statements that he made at the end of his response. 
He said that my view essentially espouses what he called a race war between Arabs and Jews. And then he said that I seem to hold to a modified form of what he called the Satan's seed heresy. Now, first of all, uh, someone who teaches and believes a heresy is most often <laughs> called a heretic. Uh, and a heretic is essentially viewed as being outside of the faith. Now, the Satan seed heresy, what he calls, it's really not a heresy. It's just some oddball, weird doctrine. I've never met anyone that actually believes this. But it's the idea that Satan actually had sex with, with Eve. And that there are actually people in the earth that are literal, physical children. Uh, of Satan. Now, let me just say this. The reason, Chris, that I invited you to debate is because I believed, and I still do, that that's not who you are, um, that this is, that, that you're above that. And look, th those who are mature in the body of Christ, we're so sick of this kind of thing. And I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. I really do. But let me just say that I didn't deserve that. And, and even more importantly, those who are listening to this, those who are watching, we're doing this to edify the body of Christ, to help the body of Christ grow in understanding. They deserve better. Everyone listening to this deserves better than that. So let me just say this in all sincerity, okay? You are better than this. I'm just going to leave it there, okay? Now, let me actually jump into uh, discussing what I actually did say. First of all, I pointed to the Genesis 3.15 foundational declaration of God that throughout history, there would be a conflict between two seed lines that would each produce a king. And the end times would be the culmination of this conflict, when the righteous king kills the unrighteous king. And then I said, who are these two seed lines? Who does the Bible reveal these two seed lines to be? Well, as the biblical narrative moves forward, we see that the righteous seed line is the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The New Testament reveals that it includes Christians, the church, those who are spiritual children of Abraham by faith. Now, as the biblical narrative moves forward, we also see that the primary spiritual children of Satan, just to be clear, are those who follow the will of their father, Satan. And they are primarily seen to be adversarial, hostile, invading Gentile kingdoms. So we see the invasion of Assyria. We see Babylon. We see Antiochus Epiphanes. And these are the primary prototypes and shadows of the ultimate end time conflict. What do they all do? They invade the land of Israel. They destroy the land of Israel. They lead the people away into exile. This story has been repeated multiple times throughout the biblical narrative. The end times is simply the final cycle. So we can look back to the events of Assyria, Babylon, and Antiochus Epiphanes especially, and see a foreshadow of what's to come, right? Now, Chris says, because I emphasize Antiochus Epiphanes as a foreshadow of the Antichrist, that I am using an approach to interpretation that, quote, no responsible commentators would ever do. And I go, okay, look, first of all, analogies always do break down. That's why they're called analogies. I'm not doing that. What I'm saying is that Jesus pointed to Antiochus Epiphanes and he said, this is the primary historical example to look to, to understand what's coming. Who was Antiochus Epiphanes? He was a crazy Gentile pagan that invaded the land of Israel. And what did he do? He made Judaism illegal. He killed over 40 to 60,000 Jews who refused to disobey God. He exiled and carried away into slavery another 40 to 60,000. He made Judaism, he made keeping Torah illegal. He sacrificed a pig in the temple. He defiled the temple. Now, what Chris believes is that the Antichrist is actually going to make Torah and Judaism not only the law of Israel, but the law of the whole world. Chris says he's going to force the whole world to be circumcised. And so where he says that I'm being irresponsible for pointing to Antiochus as the shadow, as the shadow to give us an indication of what's to come, he actually takes the shadow, completely flips the story upside down and says the Antichrist is actually going to do the opposite of what the historical prototype is going to do. And he says that I'm using an irresponsible approach to biblical interpretation, and he expects us to believe that the Antichrist is actually going to do just the opposite of what Antiochus has done. 
Chris really dug in his heels. He said that after the midpoint of the final seven years, until the rapture, until the day of the Lord, it is going to be a facade of utopia. In his response, he said, it's during this earlier time that I maintain there is no evidence to suggest that the Antichrist is being hostile toward Israel. None whatsoever. If the scriptures say that from the midpoint forward, it's going to be a time of hostility for Israel, then Chris's entire theory completely falls apart. In Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, what is that? That's when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple. Jesus said, when you see that, that was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, then let those who are in all of Judea and Jerusalem flee to the mountains. Get out, right? For then there will be a great tribulation, a time of distress, such as has never occurred since the beginning of the world until now. Now, in Luke 21, which is simply Luke's telling of the same sermon, you see that Luke swaps out the abomination of desolation with Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. Again, they're both talking about the same sermon, but Luke's use of when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies as the same thing, the same time period as the abomination of desolation, then we see that what Jesus said conflicts, it contradicts Chris's entire narrative. He says, for then there will be a great distress upon the land and wrath to this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led captive into the nations. How in the world can he look at this, this exact same description of what Zechariah and Joel and Ezekiel are describing and say, this is completely different. Again, this is just an example of trying to take a square peg and drive it into a round hole. This is simple. Okay, so let's hit Ezekiel 38 and 39. Chris wants us to believe that this prophecy actually takes place at the end of the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. What does the text say? Well, the text actually says that as a direct result of Gog and his armies being destroyed, it says the nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile and I gave them into the hands of their adversaries. It goes on to describe them in coming back as former captives in the land of their enemies. So Chris wants us to believe that Jesus is such an impotent king and Messiah that he can't deliver his people, that at the end of the millennium, he's not going to defend his people. He's going to allow them to be carried away as exiles. It also says God will no longer allow his holy name to be profaned in the midst of his people Israel. So we are to believe, according to Chris's narrative, that Israel will be profaning God's name throughout the millennium. And they won't stop until the end of the millennium. What else? The house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. As if they didn't know that throughout the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. It also says, I will not hide my face from them anymore. When I pour out my spirit on the whole house of Israel, declares the Lord. So Chris wants us to believe that Israel doesn't get saved, that God doesn't pour out his spirit on Israel until the end of the thousand years. The scriptures say all Israel will be saved when they look upon the one they have pierced when Jesus returns. Paul says that all Israel will be saved when the deliverer comes from Zion. So the timing of this is so clear. What else does the text say? This is the day that I have spoken of. What is the day that he's always talking about? The day of the Lord. The Lord says that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is in the context of the day of the Lord. Not at the end of the millennium. It also says this. The Lord declares to Gog, he says, Are you not the one that I have spoken of by my former prophets? For many years I declared that in the last days I would bring you against my people Israel. So I want to leave Chris with this challenge. Chris, God says that this is the guy, Gog is the guy that all of the other prophets are talking about. Show us the verses where all of the prophets are talking about this battle that happens at the end of the millennium. And so in conclusion, all of the prophets... Jesus, the book of Revelation, they're all basically telling the same general story. It's not that complicated. Throughout history, there's been a series of hostile, invading Gentile kingdoms that have come against the land of Israel, destroyed the kingdom, carried the people away into exile. In the end times, it's going to happen one more time, except it's going to be the worst of all. But the righteous king is coming back to deliver his people.
Friends, let's not overcomplicate the story. It's really pretty simple, and all of us can understand it. Thank you, Joel. And now we move to the final round, in which each man will answer three questions posed by the other, and then conclude with some closing remarks. So first up is Chris White. Joel's question here is about the Gog-Magog War, but I want to expand that and also talk about some issues he raised in his last video about the Gog-Magog War. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, after the Gog-Magog War, it says that God's name will never be profaned again, and that after the Gog-Magog War, everyone, without exception, will truly recognize God. So Joel is saying, since I believe that there is a war after the millennium, it necessarily follows that the millennium, and certainly during the war that follows it, things aren't perfect, that people can profane God's name, and that there will be a sense in which not everybody knows God in the way that he wants them to during the millennium. I'm not sure if Joel is unaware of some pretty basic theology with regard to the millennium, namely that the millennium will be populated not just by the inhabitants of the city, but by a whole world of physical, real people who made it through the sheep and goat judgment, and presumably their children eventually as well. And while those people have longer lives, they do die and they do sin, and God deals harshly with sinners and rebellious nations during the millennium. One obvious way to show this is that after Satan is released from the pit after the thousand years, he's still able to find literally countless people on earth who want to go to war against God. And I think at least one of those soldiers, if not Satan himself, will profane God's name. It's not until this post-millennial rebellion is crushed that the great white throne judgment occurs. And these promises of no more tears, no more sin, no more rebellion, and full recognition of the sovereignty of God by everyone is fulfilled. Because it's only at that point that all the unredeemed are judged and sentenced to hell. But the specific question that Joel asks about this in this round is from Ezekiel 39, 27a, which says, when I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them from their enemies' lands. Joel wrongly concludes that this event, that is Israelites being taken into captivity, happens either just before or during the Gog Magog War, based on the fact that this paragraph is placed at the end of the chapter. But the reason that starting at verse 27, modern Bibles separate this section from the rest of the prophecy is because starting at verse 27, Ezekiel begins a summation of the prophecy that actually started several books earlier in chapter 37, which is the dry bones prophecy, where God was giving a nation of exiles in Babylon hope that one day he would restore them all to the land of Israel. Notice that chapter 38 starts off with God saying that his is a people dwelling securely, a people that he took from a war-torn land and protected. But Gog is going to try to attack them. But he won't get very far because God will utterly destroy Gog before he even gets there. This is a picture of how God will keep his promise of protection after the eschatological ingathering, a promise which he made a chapter earlier in the Dry Bones Prophecy. Again, this captivity spoken of in summary is the same one referenced in 38.8, which God brings them out of, i.e. the ingathering at the end of the 70th week, 1,000 years before the war even begins. Joel's next question reiterates his earlier point about Daniel 2. He says that in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the stone strikes the statue, which represents nations, and the statue is immediately and completely destroyed. So Joel's argument is how can this picture be about the kingdom of God being established if Rome lived on for another 400 years or so after Jesus' time? Why didn't Rome just blow up or something after Jesus established the kingdom of God? Well, first let me point out, Joel, that you're in a bit of a glass house here because you believe that in Daniel 7, the same three nations, Neo-Babylonia, Medo-Persia, and Greece in this statue, are said to be allowed to live on in the millennium after the Antichrist is thrown into the lake of fire? I thought the rock destroyed all those nations immediately and completely. How do you resolve that contradiction? Next, realize that this vision doesn't end with like Tiberius or something during Jesus' day. The whole point of the feet and toes is to show the divided nature of the East and West empires, i.e. the entire yet future history of Rome. All this says is that God will set up the kingdom of God during the Roman Empire. Also remember what Jesus said in Luke 17, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. This is a clear rebuke to you saying that the kingdom of God will be established in immediate spectacular fashion at Armageddon. That may be the culmination of the kingdom of God, but it's not its inception. Joel's next question is, how do I explain the types of Antichrist in the Bible being Gentiles? Shouldn't they be false Jewish messiahs? I think that Joel puts far too much weight on types. For example, in his books, he uses a type of Antichrist, Sennacherib, who is an Assyrian, to bolster the case that the Antichrist will be an Assyrian. 
Well, by what methodology did he rule out all the other places the other types of Antichrist came from, like Egypt or Tyre or Babylon? That hermeneutic of necessity leads to contradiction because there is no dictionary of allegories. In this case, he wants to single out their Gentileness and give it importance, but I by no means agree with his premise. For example, I see a type of Christ in Cyrus, and I see a type of Antichrist in Judas, who, by the way, is the only other person besides the Antichrist to be called a son of perdition. I could go on and list other blasphemous and murderous Jewish kings like Ahab or Herod, but the thing is, you could never prove me wrong, because that is the nature of types, and that is why no responsible commentator uses types to prove doctrine, which is exactly what you're trying to do. I know I'm supposed to be summing up the debate here, but I want to use part of my five minutes to answer a question that Joel brought up in the previous video. He brought up Luke 21 and the armies that surround Jerusalem before the abomination of desolation, and this is actually a perfect match with Daniel 11. 11, 40 through 45. Remember, the Muslim world will attack the Antichrist, but it turns out to be a really bad move because the Antichrist will take his army on the greatest campaign in history, completely subduing all of Israel's enemies. Once that is done, he and his army march to Jerusalem. He pitches his palatial or royal tents between the seas toward or in the glorious mountain, i.e. Jerusalem. But he will come to his end, which is weird because Daniel also makes it clear by the words at that time in the next verse that the abomination of desolation happens after he comes to his end, which we can confirm because Daniel uses the same phrase that Jesus quotes in the Olivet Discourse, a time of trouble such as never been, etc., etc., which we know of as the Great Tribulation, which begins at the abomination of desolation. So we have to assume that the Antichrist's resurrection happens just after his victorious battle but just before the abomination of desolation. One interesting note is that what we just read here in Daniel 11 and 12 was interpreted by early rabbinic commentators on the Talmud as being a picture of the Messiah liberating Israel. They called this warlike liberator Messiah ben Joseph. And the idea was that after defeating all of Israel's enemies, in other words, they saw this as a parallel of Isaiah 11, etc., he would take his armies just outside Jerusalem, where he would be killed by sort of a, a Jewish antichrist they called Armelus. But Messiah ben Joseph would be resurrected by another Messiah, Messiah ben David, at this point, and then the Messianic Age would begin. I only mention this to say I'm not the only one who sees a resurrected liberator of Israel in Daniel 11. In any case, back in Luke 21 when it says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you know its desolation is near. Does desolation mean destruction here? Well, we have a parallel passage in both Mark and Matthew, which makes it clear that Luke was actually referring to the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist sits in the temple and declares himself to be God. And again, remember, this is exactly what's being described in Daniel 11 and 12. A war, a surrounding of armies, a death, a resurrection, an abomination followed by a persecution unlike any other and ultimately followed by a resurrection of the dead in all the passages. In summary, I think I've tried to answer every substantive point that Joel brought up in this debate, and I don't feel like he has done the same. I think that he's taken every opportunity to waste his time on what seems like false outrage. He is constantly doing the very things that he's accusing me of doing. In my opinion, I think it seems transparent that I won, but it's really hard to tell in a bubble like this. For those of you that have made it this far, I've decided to make my book The Islamic Antichrist Debunked free from here on out. Um, no strings attached, it's just a PDF link on the books page of my podcast website, BibleProphecyTalk.com. If any of you out there would have preferred me and Joel to debate, for example, his view, will the Antichrist be a Muslim, you don't have to wonder. That's what I did in this book. I took everything that Joel has said in his past three books on the concept of the Islamic Antichrist, took his best arguments, and argued them point by point in that book. And I believe that, just like in this debate, you'll see that his arguments are, uh, well, just not that good. Take, for example, the idea of the uh, Antichrist being an Assyrian. He, he bases that off a false premise, built on a false premise. Or the idea of the Mahdi and uh, Isa, the Dajjal. If you've ever wondered where those things came from, uh, they're basically forgeries from the Middle Ages, Christian forgeries from the Middle Ages about the last Roman emperor. I hope this debate has showed people that Joel is talented at making things seem right until he is cross-examined. And for that reason, I believe that if you don't know the Bible better than Joel does, he will be able to convince you of whatever he wants to convince you of. This isn't something I want to be known for. I was shadow banned from YouTube, my other uh, film, Ancient Aliens Debunked, where I debunk ancient aliens, 
Uh, you can't find my upload on YouTube with over 10 million views, even if you type the exact name into the search bar because it's been shadow banned because explicitly because of this view about the Jewish Antichrist. So it's not helping me. I know you won't believe this, but I was prepared and still am prepared to take my books off the shelf if I hear a different argument. Those books have been out for a long time now. I've heard just about any argument that people can make have been made. Um, and I feel like they're all answerable at this point. I feel like it all works. I know what it's like for a view not to work. I've held different views. I've held the Roman Antichrist view. I've held the alien Antichrist view. I've held the Islamic Antichrist view and I've held this view. So I know what it's like to, to swallow your pride and change your position, not just on this view, on several views. So, so you, I don't know, if, again, if you'll believe me, but I'm ready to throw, it, throw everything about this in the fire. I have no reason not to. And I don't want to be known for this, and I know this is a really weird way to end the debate, but uh, go to my uh, website, BibleProphecyTalk.com. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And now to answer three questions from Chris and conclude with his closing remarks is Joel Richardson. Now, Chris's first question is, how do you explain Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10, which says that the Gog Magog war occurs at the end of the millennium? Great question. Easy. Now, first of all, let me point out uh, one of the straw man arguments that Chris made. He actually makes several, um, but essentially what he did is he said, Joel believes that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is talking about Armageddon. It happens in this very narrow window just before the return of Jesus or just at the end of the final seven years. And he goes, that is absurd. Okay. So this is classic straw man argument. He explains something that I don't believe, and then he calls it absurd. He tears it down and calls it absurd. This is a classic debate tactic, okay? What I actually teach and what the text says, and what I actually explain, by the way, uh, in my book, is that the prophecy is speaking of a broad period of time. It begins, where does the prophecy begin? What does the text say? It says that I will place this thought into your mind, O Gog, and I will essentially give you the idea to invade a land of unwalled villages. So it begins all the way back when the Antichrist gets the very idea of invading Israel. And then it talks about the invasion and it ends, it ends with Israel being returned as former prisoners of war from the land of their enemies. Okay, so the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, in my perspective, or let's say the Ezekiel 39 prophecy, it covers a broad period of time from probably before the final seven years right up until the return of Jesus. So now let's look at a few key differences between the two prophecies. Revelation 20 says that these hordes, these armies gather around the camp of the saints but fire falls from heaven and devours them. They are devoured outside of the camp of the saints. Ezekiel 38 and 39, on the other hand, says they invade a land of unwalled villages. God kills them and their bodies are strewn all over Israel. It says on the mountains of Israel. So they successfully invade Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39. In Revelation 20, they don't. And Chris goes on and he says, the very idea that Israel is presently living securely in the land, he says, that is absurd. Well, if it's so absurd, then I would say, why is Chris going to Israel in a few months? He said in his podcast, he's going to Israel. If it's, if it's not safe, then why are you going, Chris, if, if it's that absurd? No, I would say that it's absurd to say that Israel is presently not living securely. You have over 3 million Christians a year that are visiting Israel as tourists. Most people today feel very secure. They are not expecting a massive regional invasion of their land, but that day is coming. So there is a clear reflection in Revelation 20 of what had happened a thousand years earlier, but that doesn't mean they're the same thing. Now listen, it is so critical to understand that in order for Chris's entire theory to work, he has to move Ezekiel 38 and 39 to the end of the millennium. If it doesn't, his entire Jewish Antichrist theory completely falls apart. Okay, so Chris's second question is he says, how do you explain the blood of the prophets and all the blood of the slain on the earth being found in Mystery Babylon, when both of those things can only be found in Jerusalem according to Jesus? And he cites two different passages. Again, let's read these. 
Jesus says, therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on the earth. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, if we read the full context of what Jesus is saying here, he's simply warning Israel that they are about to be judged for their sins. What about the next verse? Jesus says, it is impossible that a prophet should be killed outside of Jerusalem. Now, that's the NET translation. Now, it's important to point out that this is a very rare translation. If you look at really the overwhelming consensus of pretty much every translation, they don't say killed. They say uh, it cannot be that a prophet would perish. In other words, die. Uh, outside of Jerusalem. So he says, it can't be that a prophet, in other words, the prophet, would perish outside of Jerusalem. The inference is very simple. He's basically saying it can't be that a prophet who's called to Jerusalem would die outside of Jerusalem. I mean, hello. But the idea that he's making this sort of rigid technical statement that says a prophet can only die in Jerusalem, that's essentially what Chris is telling us. Moses, Moses never even entered Israel. Samuel, the prophet, he died in Ramah. Jeremiah died down in Egypt. Daniel, Ezekiel, they died in Babylon. Okay, so either Jesus made a very factually wrong statement uh, or Chris's interpretation is wrong. And in this case, I'm going to have to go with Jesus. So what is it talking about then when it talks about Babylon in Revelation being guilty for the slain of all the saints throughout the earth? Well, again, we need to remember that this is in the context of the last days, not 2,000 years ago. Okay, so just think about this today. Right now, there are more Christians being slain throughout the earth than in any time in history. There are, there are more martyrdoms right now than at any time in history. And if you look at a simple map of the primary nations that are responsible, overwhelmingly, they are Muslim-majority nations. So what I'm saying is that what is already happening is going to increase. Okay, Chris's third question is he says, John uses the term the great city with the definite article the to refer to mystery Babylon in Revelation 16 verse 19. He uses the exact same term with the definite article to refer to Jerusalem in Revelation 11 verse 8. How do you explain that? Well, easy. And this is amazing to me. This is really amazing to me that Chris doesn't understand. Not only does he not understand the larger overarching biblical narrative, um, but he doesn't understand the basic storyline of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is telling the story of two very different women that are representatives. They are symbolic of two very different cities. Yes, they're both called the great city. The Bible refers to other cities, by the way, as the great city. It refers to Nineveh as the great city. Um, but that's beside the point. Look, Revelation 17, verse 1, introduces the harlot. Okay, she's one of the women. Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. She sits on many waters, and she's sitting on the beast. Okay, so she's in partnership with the Antichrist, with his kingdom. She's in partnership with Satan. Okay, but there's another woman, and she's introduced back in Revelation 12 and 13, and she is a woman that Satan is trying to devour. The beast wants to go after her and kill her. But the Lord gives her a place of refuge in the desert. Now, later in Revelation 21, the same woman that the beast, Satan, is trying to devour her, she's revealed to be Jerusalem. Okay, so two cities. One is Jerusalem. One is Babylon. Revelation 21, 9 through 10. Come here. I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Again, this is the same woman Israel, Jerusalem, back from Revelation 12 and 13. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Um, as I pointed out earlier, uh, Chris looks at this story of the harlot in the book of Revelation, but he doesn't seem to even understand the Old Testament backstory. What is that backstory? Well, it's real simple. God made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, and it's a marriage covenant. The Bible treats the Sinaitic or Mosaic covenant as a marriage covenant. And then repeatedly throughout the scriptures, God refers to Israel in her unfaithfulness as a harlot. But every time he talks about restoring her, the entire book of Hosea revolves around this. God tells Hosea, marry Gomer, marry a harlot. Now within this metaphor, the harlot is Israel. 
God is Hosea. God tells Hosea to demonstrate what he himself is like by marrying a harlot. But how does the prophecy of Hosea end? It says, it will come about in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me Ishi, you will call me husband, and you will no longer call me master. I will marry you forever. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and compassion. Then I will marry you in faithfulness. The story ends with Israel being redeemed because God himself is faithful. Israel may not be faithful, but God is Now, listen, um, I understand. I understand that I was pretty passionate during different parts of this debate, and I want to uh, at least end by explaining why. Uh, I want to be very clear. I don't believe that Chris is a visceral anti-Semite. I want to be really clear. I don't believe that he hates the Jewish people in any way, shape, or form. Chris is a very reasonable, again, very articulate guy, okay? However, it is very difficult. I I would say it's, it's impossible. It's impossible to hold Chris's position. Listen, it is impossible to claim that the single most persecuted and hated minority group throughout the history of mankind, the Jewish people, that they are about to rise up and conquer the world, empowered by Satan, and kill millions of Christians throughout the earth. It's impossible to teach that and write about it and proclaim it In this current atmosphere, where anti-Semitism once again is exploding throughout the earth, throughout Europe, throughout the United States, and sadly, in the church. Guys, there are anti-Semites in the church, all over YouTube, and their leaven is spreading. It is toxic. It is impossible to teach what Chris teaches in this atmosphere without absolutely undergirding and encouraging hatred of the Jewish people, without encouraging satanic conspiracy theories that are not true concerning the Jewish people. Now listen, Chris is not one of these wild-eyed anti-Semitic guys on YouTube that's spouting all kinds of hate, but he is their theologian. This is my point. He is articulating a perspective that demonizes the Jewish people. The bottom line, it demonizes Judaism as the great end time deception. And so again, I've written about the long and bloody painful history of how Christian theology and ideas has led to the mistreatment of the Jewish people by Christians. I'm very familiar with this. The Jewish people are very familiar with this. What we teach affects people and it matters. It really matters. And so this is exactly why I am so passionate. I will die on this hill. And this is exactly why I'm appealing to Chris, please prayerfully reconsider what you're teaching. Thank you, Joel, and thank you, Chris. And thank you for watching this debate. Both men, as you can see, prepared thoroughly for their presentations, a lot of scripture, has been cited to support both positions here, and that's only right and proper. And now the correct response for you and me is to likewise dig into the Word, like the Bereans praised by Paul, who daily searched the Scriptures to see if these things be so. There are a number of questions that, as I watched and took notes of this debate, that that seem to me to have a real impact on how you answer the central question of this debate, will the Antichrist be a false Jewish Messiah? So in way of summary, let me just run through these very quickly. Who are the four nations of Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7? And do they foretell the same event? In other words, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the giant statue and Daniel's vision of the four strange beasts emerging from the sea. Are they the same four nations in both cases? And do they foretell the same events? That is important. Does the sea in Revelation 13 represent the Gentiles? Remember, the beast the Antichrist in Revelation 13 emerges from the sea. If that represents the Gentiles, obviously that affects how you answer the central question of this debate. Is Mystery Babylon Jerusalem? Or will it be Mecca? Or there are, are there other cities that are even better fits? You've probably heard other theories such as Rome, New York, Moscow, and others. How you answer that question, important. The nature of the Antichrist, As you know, Joel proposed the idea of an Islamic Antichrist, which Chris has responded to in one of his books. Why would an Islamic Antichrist, a Muslim Antichrist, be hostile to Israel's next door Muslim neighbors? But on the flip side of that question, why would the Jews accept a leader who sets himself up in the temple? 
And finally, Gog, Gog of Magog, leader of the coalition that comes against Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Is Gog of Ezekiel the Antichrist of the New Testament? Again, how you answer that question and where you place the Gog-Magog war, very important. Does it occur and end at Armageddon or does it happen after the millennial reign? All of these questions, very important to how you come down on the question, will the Antichrist be a false Jewish Messiah? And again, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to Chris White and Joel Richardson, both for the opportunity to participate in this debate, but also for their years of teaching and education on end times Bible prophecy, which is a subject of great importance to us as Christians. That is the blessed hope that we have. As dark as things are in this world, we know that a better day is coming. It's been promised to us, and our Lord and Savior is coming back for us. So until then, we keep working. Thank you for watching. I'm Derek Gilbert, and may God bless you.